So let me tell you guys about Aluma. So Aluma is A-L space U-M-M-A-H. Like that girl from Descendants, Uma, except there's an H at the end. The main character of Ant Farm, and now she's in Descendants now. And I know about Descendants because I have two little cousins and they love that movie. Damn. <laughs> Aluma is a terrorist organization based me. <laughs> it's funny because like you have these interspersed across it because like this is this is the camp, right? You see, Aluma means like the family. Like that's kind of what it, that's like what it roughly translates to, I think. I'm not sure. I don't know. It's Arabic. But it's, I think that's what it means. Like the community or something like that, you know? Like I hear people, oh, like, oh, bro, the whole, the whole like Uma is like, you know, I don't know. I wonder if the terrorist group has an Instagram. Do these guys roll your, wait, dude. No, I meant to zoom in, idiot. What? That's Ishan. That's Ishan. Who else do I recognize? So these are all the staff, right? Damn. I don't know anyone else here. No, this is only staff. Ishan never told me he was a, a counselor at Aluma. This is Aluma. It's um, it's like a 21 day, 21 like all included day uh, that like Ismailis, and it's only for Ismailis, only Ismailis get to go there. Ismailis have a lot of stuff that's like, like very exclusive to their religion. Like it's very difficult to become an Ismaili. You have to like either marry into it or be born into it. That's pretty much all you get. You don't get the option to like convert to become an Ismaili. I don't think so. I think it's very, very rare if that. So what this camp is, it's like a, it's actually a national thing. Um, and what they do is they get 50 guys and 50 girls, <clears throat> separate dorms, obviously, but they get them from all over the nation. Anybody can apply, basically, as long as you're a smiley. And they get a bunch of counselors and staff as well. And then they fly them all out to a location to do all this, like, summer camp shit, right? And, you know, the summer camps that tend to be more um, community-based, that tend to be more like, like uh, you know, if, you, if you're just some random dude and you're like, hey, I want to go to this coding ID tech camp, right? They're not going to do very much, like, risky stuff because it's like, there's a lot of liability, you know? But if you're a part of a community, let's say you're, I don't know, a part of a, uh, like, Boy Scouts or something, right? You're going to go and you're going to do a lot more intimate, a lot more risky. Like, you're going to be given a lot more freedom. You're going to be out here, like, building campfires and setting up, to, like, all this stuff, right? That's what we did. We uh, journeyed throughout, like, caves and things like that. Like, that's what we were doing. Um, if you're a part of a private school, the camps are going to be a lot more intimate than if you're a part of a public school. You're going to be doing a lot more risky stuff, basically. Um, and religion is the peak of that. Anybody knows, like, if you go to a Christian camp or a religious camp, they're going to have you doing stuff that you could really, really take advantage of, like, really fun stuff. Like, uh, those little cousins I mentioned earlier, they're not old enough to go to Aluma, obviously. Uh, not obviously. You guys don't even know the ages. But their parents are like, oh, we want to send them to something. So they're sending them to a Christian camp. They're not a Christian. And, you know, if this was, like, 20 years ago, it would have been looked at as, like, crazy. You're sending your kids to a Christian camp if you're, like, a Muslim, you know? That would have been, like, the most ridiculous thing ever. Nobody would dare to do that because people are like, oh, I, I can't have them, uh, like, be influenced by... And, and that was also a concern when they were talking to me about it. They were getting me my advice on the whole sort of thing, but they were like, oh, they're going to go there, they're going to go um, hunt and fish, and then they're going to catch the fish and cook it themselves and all that stuff. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. That sounds like something they... Like a core memory they'd remember for years. Uh, these girls are... At the time, they were eight years old. So I'm like, do it. Absolutely. You know? Like, kids are smart enough to realize, like, they're smart enough to pick up on their surroundings. And you know what? Whatever happens is meant to happen. If they end up going there and they're so conflicted about, like, the fact that they're around all these Christians, which is, like, that's so unlikely to happen. They're, like, so tame and everything. They're not going to start fights about all this stuff. They're not going to go out here going, oh, you're wrong and all this stuff. But even if that sort of thing happens, it'll be a learning experience. All of this stuff is just a learning experience. So it's, um, it's a good idea to do these sorts of things. But it's risky. It's high risk, high reward. And Aluma is one of these camps that is high risk, high reward. And it is as deep as it goes into religion. Like, if you try your entire life, if you dedicate your whole life to going to Aluma, but you're not a smiley, you will not be able to go. Like, it is a very exclusive club. I'm not trying to say that to, like, show off or whatever. I actually don't even think it's a good thing that it's a very exclusive club. But um, in a way, that, di that did make it more enjoyable. Because it's like everybody there was on the same page. Everybody there spoke the same languages. We all had the same upbringing. We all, like, we had things in common. A lot of things in common that you would not be able to have if it was a less intimate group. So I guess that's, there is value in the exclusivity of uh, these sorts of religious camps and all that. It's just luck of the draw, I guess. I just got lucky with it. <clears throat> so, what's the intended goal? Like, why do this? Like, why go to Aluma? Um, for participants, it's super fun. They have a lot of fun there. So they... It's incentivized to go there because everybody always talks about it when they leave. It, oh, I've made so many good friends, such a strong family bond, whatever, right? But the people who run it, they're incentivized to keep the camp going 
because it gets participants to follow Islam more. Because um, it's full of like 16 and 17 year olds, right? I was 17 when I went. That's like the main age. It's like um, your, your summer of when you're rising from junior to senior. That's when most people go because it's one summer away from their first summer after their first college semester. So it's like a sneak peek to college, basically. And that's around the age where people generally uh, have very, very strong rebellious feelings to their religion or they just stop believing in their religion entirely. Um, that wasn't the case for me. I stopped believing 10 years earlier, but hey, they can't be right about everything. They aren't perfect. And dude, I, I remember uh, people used to give me so much shit for criticizing Islam when we were like, um, we were kids. But then when we were like 17, they were like, holy shit, dude, you were so right. So for normal people, Aluma was pretty spot on to their age. And the way that it works is like, it's packed with a lot of fun shit that you do, but it's like interspersed here and there, you know, like bits and pieces with like basically propaganda uh, saying like, and they, they really appeal to you. They're really smart about the way they do it. They're like, oh, see how being a Muslim is so great. See how much everybody hates us and how much we're victims and, and how uh, this sucks and how, how hard it is to be a Muslim in America and how you should be proud to be a Muslim and all that stuff. It appeals to like the, the, the narcissism of kids who were like, yeah, I have it so rough, even though they were privileged enough to pay two fucking thousand dollars for a 21 day trip. And by the way, they don't even pay for our flights. That's an extra expense on top of that. Um, they don't cover our liabilities, uh, no insurance. If we get hurt, that's on us and our parents. If a girl gets pregnant over there, that's on them. They barely gave us even like, like livable conditions. We stayed in the shittiest dorms, no AC, no internet, obviously, that's fine. But like, like on one of the dorms, on the second dorm that I had, the window didn't even close. I don't even know if there was a window, but it was like this like eight inch, eight square inch, uh, like square. And it just wouldn't, like there was a DIY bug net over it and that's it. Not even properly screened in. It was just like a, like a piece of fabric, basically. It's, it's ridiculous, super small dorms. I'm thinking about it now, like broken mirrors, exposed wood, um, I mean exposed wood, but like, but like exposed like wood chips, like nails uh, poking out of everything. It was like dusty as hell, no cleaning people. Um, the food privileges that we got from the college that we were staying at, it was a Kenyan college. Bro, it was so limited. Like we could go to the cafeteria um, and like get certain things, but we'd see the other college kids and they would have like unlimited access because they paid for like meal plans. And we'd be like, hey, yo, do me a favor. Uh, can I hop in line with you or can you pass me that thing over there? Because like the the college kids, they pay for like, you know, uh, $500 to $1,000 for a semester, for a whole semester of food, right? We paid two grand for 21 days and we didn't get half of what they got. Now, I would still say even after all that, it's a good deal. It's a great deal. It's actually a steal. Like you're getting an incredible experience for what is in 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 most cases for smileys a little over or maybe double their uh living condition expenses but it's like for ex experience like this it's like it's totally worth it but yeah that's the that's the intention of the people running the camp the intention is like oh they're kind of uh uh separating themselves from being an smiley muslim oh we gotta we gotta drag them back in you know so that we can continue to make more money and that's also the intention of the parents. The intention is like, we want the kids to stay in the community. You know, we don't want them leaving, going out. And also, there's also this like, um, it's somewhat of an, actually it's somewhat of a spoken thing among religions like this, which is like, hey, you probably should marry people of the same religion as you, right? And I'm pretty sure other people have the same experience as me. The, the parents will constantly tell them, hey, don't go out, marry a girl in the same religion. And they'll constantly try to set you up with you, hey, Look at this girl, she's so pretty, right? She's all, all this stuff, right? And I'm sure for girls, it's the, uh, the parents. Tell, actually, I know that's the case. And literally, I've seen that with my own eyes. Um, and so hand in hand with the intention of uh, wanting your kids to stay within the community, you know, very uh, 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 secluded from the rest of the world, they also want you to go to Aluma to potentially find like a nice, a smiley Muslim girl somewhere um, so you don't go out and marry a Gordy Lurky, uh, which means white girl. And that's on honestly, bro, most Ismaili parents today are like petrified of the idea of that. 
And they try, they try to say they're open-minded because, you know, they all vote blue, they all vote, uh, they all hate Trump because they're Muslims, even though their views are almost always red, but uh, they, they almost always vote blue. So they, so they have a lot of cognitive dissonance. So they try to go, oh, we're open-minded. We, we uh, accept uh, everyone. We accept, oh, except for everyone that's not a smiley. Then, then you got to get out of here. Then we don't want to marry you. Then we don't want our kids talking to you and all that stuff. At least that's what it is in, in the United States. The ultimate fear is like, oh, don't marry an American girl, right? That's like, I hear that from my friends' parents and all that stuff. They're like, oh, you shouldn't go out and talk to these American girls. Like, we talk about things that we're doing at school and stuff like that. And they're like, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. That's bad. Uh, you should get along more with the girls in Jamatkana, you know? It's like an underlying fear that a lot of Ismailis have. They're very closed-minded, but they like to claim they're open-minded because of the cognitive dissonance of them voting blue. Uh, so they convince themselves, oh, yeah, we're so about the future. We're so... They're really not. That's the goal. And sometimes it works. But it didn't work for me. Good try. Like, actually good try. Actually, hey, I applaud the effort. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a genuinely uh, uh, really decent attempt. And I know it worked for some of these kids. There's stories about it. Um, I don't have their names. In fact, I, I, don't, I don't have the names of anyone in my... In, who I went to camp with. I got kicked out of their group chat. Bro, I got kicked out of every group chat. But like, um, this is gonna be tough. I should have made bullet points. See, when I had, when I had, um, Mosaic, I had Snapchats, you know? I, I didn't need to recall everything because I could just go through uh, the pictures that I had on Google Photos of that time, um, and that would help me recall stuff. But we weren't allowed to have phones at Aluma. I wish I had someone who was like, uh, who had went there was like here to help me out, uh, to help like remind me of stuff. But I don't talk to anyone that I went to Aluma with. In fact, after I went to Aluma, I basically never even talked to Ismailis again after that. Oh, wait, no, no, no. There were a couple, there were a couple people that I, I remember, okay, no, no, no. I'll get to them, I'll get to them. Okay, so first off, the camp is three weeks long and each week you stay in a different dorm with a different roommate, uh, potentially two roommates, like three total. Uh, three including yourself. So the first room that I had, um, I stayed in the top floor, like near the very front, um, in, a, in a small room, one of the small rooms. And I was sharing it with this dude. Uh, I forgot his name. Um, it started with an A, I think. He was pretty cool. Um, you see, when you get into a new situation, uh, people are wary of uh, the rules of the game, right? So you'll see people who are like super introverted, super extroverted, not in the in the clinical sense, but in like the like the social social environment sense. Like there'd be people who are like super shy, who like don't want to speak to anyone, who want to feel the situation out first, who don't want to take the risk. And there'll be people who are who are like, I want to take advantage of the situation beforehand. I want to get on it early um, um, and establish myself as as one of the, like the the uh, top dogs, you know. Um, and then there's a group of people, and you could kind of split these up into three different groups, like distinct groups, and everybody would generally be in agreement. There's like the third group of people um, in the middle who don't really stand out at all, who are not like super shy, who you might want to go to to start a conversation with, to have them quote unquote break out of their shell, which is what like, that's like the buzzword of the smileys, buzz phrase of the smileys um, for like their camps and stuff. But these people are just like, uh, whatever, they, they should have things figured out, you know? And this camp, like part of the job like they, they teach the counselors when the counselors are in training they literally teach them that they, they want to get the shy reclusive people to like break out of their shell so to speak i'm sick of hearing that phrase though you hear it like every day at camp like oh break out of your shells everybody you know that stuff so for me i was the very very center of the middle group or not the middle group the uh the third group but in the middle um nobody noticed me i pulled a whole like i put a, a psyche cuspo and actually made like crazy high IQ plays to remain average. I flew under the radar. Um, I wasn't extreme on either side. And I did this because I didn't want to draw attention to myself because of the things I was doing, which I'll get to, which I'll get to. But if you're doing the things that I was doing, if you draw attention to yourself, you're going to be seen as a, as a target, as a suspect. Um, and I, I say suspect knowing full well what I'm saying, the implication of the word suspect, okay? You're going to be seen as a suspect if you, if you stand out. So... Your best course of action is to not stand out. It isn't like some psyche like, oh, I don't want to stand out because I'm quirky and that's just how it is and uh, character drama, wacky hijinks ensues. No, you don't want to stand out because it will actually ruin your plans if you stand out. If people uh, uh, 
start talking to you and, and, and start trying to um, uh, associate with you with some sort of intention to build some relationship or whatever. And you could do that to them, which you will do. You will go out and make friends. But if people start looking for friend, looking to make friends with you, you got a problem on your hands. If you, if you, and I'll get to that. I'll get to that. For most people, it's not a problem. For me, the way I am, it could be a make or break. I doubt anyone from Aluma even remembers me. Maybe a couple people, maybe. I know a couple people remember me, but 40 of the guys, um, and, and at least like 45 of the girls out of the 50 guys and girls, uh, probably don't remember me at all. There's a lot of smileys in the United States, by the way. There isn't like a small amount. Like I know like 50, 50, it's like a, no, but there's actually quite a few. Um, like there's smileys all over Dallas and Houston. There's a bit in New York. Um, there's a lot in Atlanta. And I would say the highest concentration of smileys is in Atlanta, but in general, Texas as a state has way more because they're dispersed all around uh, Austin and all that. Like they're all over the place in Texas, San Antonio and everything. Um, even a dude I mentioned earlier, Ali Bamani, who I went to Aluma with, he moved to San Antonio. I believe he moved to San Antonio, yeah, like a few months before Aluma. So it was so cool to see him again. Um, but Texas area is not nearly as condensed. Like each individual city, like Dallas and Houston probably have the most, but um, Atlanta has like, Atlanta by itself has almost as much as Dallas and Houston combined. So at, at camp, there were like 35 people from Atlanta and then like 40, no, 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 there was like 30 people from Atlanta and then like 40 from Houston and Dallas and Austin combined. And then like um, the remaining uh, 30 were from all the other places. And whenever we competed, we, w we would always like, it's not that we grouped up into cities, it's that it's that like people would form groups. It's not, it wasn't intentional. It's just groups would just tend to uh, have cities in them. And it was like, sometimes people would end up not with their city, um, with the people who were same, from same city as them but they would still root for that team. And every time there would be a group thing, Atlanta always won. Like every time, dude. The spoken word shit, the dance contest, the um, field day type of thing. Atlanta always won and nobody was surprised. Okay, yeah, so um, nobody noticed me um, except for the people that I chose to like, I stuck to on the low, you know? So much so that when, um, when everyone made their group chats, I went a little too far because when everyone made their group chats, when they got back, Cause you get your phones and everybody makes group chats for their city. Like, hey, let's all do reunions, right? The Atlanta group chat literally forgot to add me. I was the only one out of like all 30 people. I was the only one that they forgot to add. Me and Asen, who's one of the guys who I talked to afterwards, we checked the group chat on his phone. Everyone was there but me. I never showed up to any of the reunions or anything like that. I didn't plan on showing up anyways, but um, yeah, it was kind of odd how they just, how every single one of them forgot about me. Actually, a couple people didn't forget. A couple of people asked me like, hey, bro, why don't you show up to the reunion? They just didn't realize I wasn't in the group chat. Um, but the people who were adding people forgot to add me. So for me, my strategy was instead of being uh, like a, a force of nature, right? Um, or like super extroverted, or instead of being uh, super shy and like a passive protagonist, I was gonna be just on the fence, always. So naturally, my roommate, I was the perfect person to be this dude's roommate because he was very introverted, so to speak. I hate using that word, but every day I would like, uh, I would like, I could be myself, you know? Because it's not like he's going to, so I would like push him to like break out of his shell, you know? I'd be like, hey, dude, you're probably not going to see these people again. And if you don't want to see them again, you don't have to. Like, this is your chance to take advantage, you know? This is an adventure because I, I never... I never cared about like the social embarrassment shit or anything like, or maybe that's just what I tell myself, right? I was told by one of the girls there that I was completely socially inept, like utterly socially inept, but hey, who's to say? I never felt afraid to interact socially, but at the same time, I, I never craved it. I did when I was little, um, but I think that's just a part of uh, your formative years is you want to learn about others and, and how they behave so that you can learn for yourself how to behave. You want to be a part of society. You want the attention, you know, you want the friends. So I did when I was little and I was kind of spoiled and an asshole at that time. But I mean, ever since I was like, I don't know, 13, 14, something like that, I really did not have any sort of craving for, um, like I could spend days, weeks, probably months just by myself without saying a word. Like those monks who go on those like several month long, no speaking vows. 
I could do that. And I actually have done it for like a couple of weeks uh, unintentionally. It doesn't intrigue me anymore to, to be in these like very social settings. I don't know what it is. I'm just not like super attracted to it anymore. But it's not that I'm a- averse to, to being in social settings. I'm actually just completely indifferent now. I do enjoy it uh, when it's around people I-, I like. But when meeting new people, like I really, like I don't care about them. Like I, I literally just view them as NPCs. So... It's easy for me to do this sort of thing. It's very easy for me to go out there and, and show people, like inspire people, like embarrass myself, whatever. I don't really care. That's why I think I'll be a such a good, such a good IRL streamer because I'll take the risks. I'll be the the G- Gideon and and the Bale and Levine and all this stuff. Like I'll do these things that will get me in trouble because I really don't care. As long as I don't get arrested, I'll do whatever. So because of that, this dude could talk to me because I understood the situation with him. I had been like that too. Um, and I wasn't such a tryhard for attention. In fact, when we were in our room together at night, we had nothing to do because for the first like couple of nights, that's just how it works where people stay awake because they're so excited. We would just talk and we would just like stay up for hours and just like speak. I would be on the top bunk, he'd be on the bottom bunk because I always get the top bunk no matter what. So the thing is, is like he was still, it's not like he was like an inherently shy person. It just... People, people play it by ear, you know, they feel it out when they get there. I don't care about feeling it out, like, ever. I'll just say whatever. But at the end of the day, he was still, like, you know, like a dude. There's a reason why he was able to stay up so easily on the first night. It's because he was so excited. And it's because he understood the prospect of Aluma and what people hyped it up to be in. And he, he's one of the, he's one of the people like me. He's one of the, um, the soldiers who will stay up late at night, who will make fun of the people who fall asleep at the sleepover first because uh, the people who are able to stay up, who get excited at night, who get more energy when the sun goes down, are the people who will protect the tribe so that the women and children and old men can sleep and they can be safe and we'll make sure a bear doesn't come infiltrate the camp and eat all of them. Like we are, we have that, that, the masculine urge. That's what it is. You know, people, oh, the masculine urge to do this and that. Nah, bro, we had the masculine urge to, to stay awake for absolutely no reason. There's a link right there, by the way, with ADHD and being almost exclusively psychological disorder that affects almost always men. I don't think it's odd at all, but a lot of psychologists are like baffled as to how that works. To me, it makes total sense. But um, he, he was with the shit and he understood like if I would like when I, when we would talk about things like he he wasn't just like some like goody goody like we were up at night on the first night literally plotting to steal Oreos. And the thing is, you might think like, OK, what the hell are you talking about stealing Oreos? You see, the meta of Aluma for most people is Oreos. We don't get sweets all day. And we're forced to eat like this like boring, bland food day after day. And then finally at night during debrief, we get two Oreos and a cup of milk. And it's tradition. It's been tradition since uh, I think either near the beginning of Aluma or the beginning of Aluma. And it's like, it's very well known. And let me fucking tell you, dude, I used to take a six pack of Oreos to um, school every day. I got sick of it. I would just hand it out to people. Cause like, it was like, I didn't, I like Chips Ahoy more than I like Oreos. But when I got those two Oreos every night and no other sweets the whole day, holy shit, it was so fucking good, dude. It, by itself, it was better than eating all the desserts that I would eat on a regular basis. This made up for all the other sugary stuff I'd eat, plus more. And this is tradition at Aluma. It's kind of what they're known for actually. Like before I went to Aluma, I already knew about this. And um, it's been happening so many years uh, that like the same thing um, where like people try to steal the Oreos, this same sort of uh, motivation keeps happening and the meta keeps evolving. You see, when my older brother did Aluma <clears throat> four years older, four, four years earlier, they were still very secure about it. They knew people try to steal it every year. Um, and my brother actually like formed a team and they went into the basement and literally stole it. Like they did a... They did an Oreo heist. That's what he called it, the Oreo heist. And the way he told the story was like, it was for real on some like prison break type shit. Like each person had their role. Uh, they had lookouts and like MLG call outs and shit. They did like the heist and they got all the Oreos. And over the years, the kids got better and better at stealing the Oreos and the counselors got better and better at hiding them. And this sort of back and forth uh, eventually led to the counselors overpowering the participants because for like the past two years before I did a Luma almost no Oreos were stolen but then again I'm me so and I am showing off this whole stream is just me showing off um the fact that I could take these like very mundane camp experiences and really elevate them so the sort of thing that my brother did that wasn't viable anymore that was not a viable strategy first of all finding the Oreos was a real challenge 
on the first day, get this. No, not on the first day. On the first, no, on the second day, we found the Oreos in the fucking laundry machines that the college students use. We found it there. And we're like, okay, okay, no, no, no. It's, it's too risky right now. We like saw it there. And we're like, okay, we'll come back for it um, later. There was counters around and shit. And it was like, we could have taken the Oreos, but we would not, we would not have been able to sneak it back to our dorms. Um, and it was me and two other people, not my roommate, but I involved my roommate in on this. And I told him, I was like, we gotta, we gotta steal the Oreos, bro. And I believe it was, it was me and one other guy. It might've been my roommate, but I, I'm not sure who it was. It was 50, 50 shot, my roommate or one of the other dudes. Um, and we went back down there to check for it while everybody was in the showers. So we took showers super quickly, like 30 seconds. Didn't even shower, <laughs> just hop in the water, hop back out. Hardly even get wet, bro. We probably don't even dry ourselves. I don't remember. It's, it's, it's a fuzzy memory. Um, that part's the fuzzy memory, but the very vivid memory is where, look, like, we're, we're on a mission, okay? Like, when you're in the zone like that, everything moves in slow motion. You're like, you're in flow state, right? We go down there. We look in the laundry machine that it was in. It's gone. And then we see, like, a couple of days later where they're getting the Oreos for, because we show up to debrief super early because we're always on the lookout. And this was where everybody was there, but I like looked at my friends, I was like, hey, yo, be on the lookout, you know? We find that they fucking locked them in a safe, like an actual, with a passcode. So it's like, dude, you're not, be, th there's no back and forth here anymore. There's no like playful banter. There's no like, oh, you want to steal the Oreos? Give it your best shot. See, I'd like to see you try. There's like, no, you're not stealing them. And this kind of thing would discourage a lot of people like, hey, the game's done. The game's gone, right? Um, and I feel like nowadays, because I was streaming earlier, and I'll, I'll leave that stream in the description. I was talking to my cousin, and his older brother's at Adaluma literally right now, literally as we speak. He comes back in uh, two days. Like, he called um, his little brother, and I was talking to him. I was playing uh, golf with your friends with him, and he was telling me, like, hey, he didn't actually, he wasn't, he said he wasn't enjoying it because it was a lot stricter. And it's like, yeah, they, they made it way, way, way stricter this sort of like the game is over basically like this sort of thing is not going to be very frequent now um like the way it used to be and i think we were the last camp to really take advantage of it so naturally we didn't know the game was over so it was our mission as participants as it is every year as it's known it, like people talk about this stuff where they go they find the oreos and they steal them i mean it's such a shame actually like i feel like they should make the oreos like a bit easier to steal i feel like that's that's part of what makes the camp so fun for some of the people that go there. The, the the challenge of like pulling off this insane heist. None of the new camps do this sort of thing. Even though our security there was pretty tight, ultimately their their problem, their main problem was just allowing me to be a participant. They did everything right. Okay, if they didn't have me as a participant, none of the Oreos they wouldn't have they wouldn't they would have counted every single Oreo for exactly what it was and not have miscounted once. The one thing they forgot, mate, I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. I'll always find a flaw in their security, always. People at school, uh, in, in elementary school, bro, I'd be in fourth grade and fifth grade um, in Jackson Elementary. People used to call me Michael Schofield. So we try to stay up every night, right? My roommate, he had a watch and what he would do is he would set timers for random times at night um, where we'd let, like rest, we'd wake up, we'd go check, he'd wake me up. Uh, we'd like take turns and like every 15 to 20 minutes or so we'd check um to see oh is, is the coast clear here's the problem the counselors were like fucking patrolling the halls like it's like north korea dmz and they would not like let off the gas like they there's no way we could have left that room and what's crazy is the lights were on in the hallway as far as i can tell on the first night there was never a single moment of the night where somebody wasn't patrolling the halls. And there were two floors, so there was two separate, uh, like, uh, shift areas, you know? But there was always somebody on each floor, always. It would, it would have been a futile task to try to break out. And we basically don't sleep the entire night. Uh, we sleep for a little bit, like, I think for like an hour or so, at like 3 a.m. But, um, yeah, I don't think we got a minute of REM that entire night. So we were all woken up at 6 a.m., they bang on the doors, and we were pretty damn tired. After a couple of days of doing this, yeah, we were sleeping on time. They intentionally make us let you get very little sleep. A smart move on their part. You only get six to six or so hours, six to six and a half or so hours of sleep every night. Like you actually don't get your full uh, eight, which you're supposed to get. Even seven is, is actually too little. 
um, from the from the literature that I've seen. But it's a very very smart move because it's like, hey, sacrifice three weeks of your of of ideal sleep, which you've already been doing probably anyways if you're at that age of the counselors, and the benefit of that is you'll prevent the participants from screwing things up basically, right? Or or what they would consider to be screwing things up, and so. Literally after like day one, most people gave up on trying to sneak out. Um, well, until the end of the camp rolled around. But we'll get to that because we were playing a long game. It's like when um, it's like a, a Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor type strategy. Let them wear themselves out. Let the counselors become completely sleep deprived. And um, when they're weak, when they're gassed out, that's when we'll hit the gas. You know, that's when we strike. That's opportunity strikes. But we'll get to the end of the camp. I'm trying to go in chronological order. Okay, I need to preface some things before I before I continue. There's a few things actually. The legends board is like the first thing that that comes to mind. You see, um, we're all trying new things at this camp. Like this is a very like this is a new location. It's Gambier, Ohio, uh, and there's like a college that we stayed in there, uh, Kenyon College, I believe. It's a it's a pretty pretty sizable college, um, a like pretty sizable campus, I mean. And the entire camp, like, not just the setting was brand new. It was like. The, the curriculum and everything. Like, it was the first time they switched it up in years. Um, I think that was the first time they switched it up ever. Like, this was the first major Aluma redesign um, that has ever been there since, like, the inception of the camp. First major camp restructuring. It was a uh, 2017 Camp 1, if you're curious what it was. So, because there was all this new shit that was going on. New curriculums, new activities new field trips, all that stuff. Like, everybody would generally do the same thing before. Um, so it was all very predictable, and uh, they could have a lot tighter security. But, like, this time, because everything was so, uh, un- like, ill-prepared, relatively, compared to the other camps, the counselors and staff couldn't really, um, couldn't really control uh, this camp the way that... The- Even Camp 2, like, because there's two camps a year. So we were Camp 1 of 2017. We're the brand new first one ever in Gambier, Ohio. And even Camp 2 was so much stricter. I hear all these stories like they didn't do half the shit we did. Because as participants, we realized like we had strength in numbers. And if they're not going to be organized enough to like have control over the situation, we're going to take control. The rebellion will rise up. It, it didn't take long at all for, for the participants to realize the counselors know just as much about what's going on with the camp as we do. It wasn't organized properly. Like like their training was, was very um was very inefficient. Like... They did not know about activities beforehand. They knew, they found out about what activities we were doing at the same time the participants found out about it. So they were not prepared at all for the rebellion that ensued. One of the things, uh, the new things that they did with our camp was the legends board. And this was like my favorite thing. I love this concept. I love, like psychology has shown, groups who chant together stay together. And so what it was is in the debrief room, this is such a genius idea. Whoever thought of this, hats off to you, bro. You deserve like some of the money that Aluma makes because of this. Um, and it was actually... They even told us it was like three of the counselors who were in our camp. Um, I believe Ali Khan Bao was one of them. Uh, like the, these three or four or whatever counselors um, were responsible for coming up with it. And it was only the guys. The girls didn't have a legends board. It was only the guys that had a legends board. So like in the debrief room, right? Like the, it's this main area. It's like this like living room area where um all, there's like all sofas and shit and there's like fans. We would wake up, you know, we'd shower, get ready. Um... Well, some people would shower if they woke up early enough. I wouldn't. I'd shower in the middle of the day. I was not getting up early enough. So after everybody was ready, we'd go sit in the debrief room. We'd wait for everyone. And at night, before we'd go to sleep, we'd also come to the debrief room at the end of the day. Uh, and that's when we'd get our Oreos. And when everyone got their Oreos and they were eating, they were snacking down it. You would think two Oreos they'd finished in a second, right? No, we, we enjoyed it. Like, we were sitting there eating two Oreos and a tiny, like, Dixie cup of milk, basically, for, like, ten... 15 minutes. I really spread it out, man. We were enjoying that. And during that time, we're all talking. It's like really intimate. Uh, we're having good laughs. And people would be like, all right, everyone, silence, silence. Um, and, and people, like counters, would stand up while everyone else is sitting down. And they would add people to the legends board um, throughout the debrief. Like whenever there was a counter that decided, and we're still eating while he's like saying this thing. So if a counselor decided, or a group of counselors decided that, like, uh, one of the participants did something, like, um, exceptional, like, they, they went above and beyond, then they would, like, stand up, they'd make a toast to them, they'd say a little speech, like, oh, uh, this person, I knew this person, in the beginning of camp, I met him here, uh, and I thought, you know, maybe he's got a lot of room to do this and this, and then he, did that, and then he was talking to these guys, I saw, and he says a little speech, right, he says, like, a two, three minute speech about the participant, 
And he's like, shout out to you, dude. Go ahead, put your name on the legends board. And so when, oh no, they'd say everybody first, they'd say all their speeches first. And then once all the speeches were done and we were all done eating our Oreos, because it, t- it did take a while because we were moving slow. So then everybody would stand up and we'd make like, we'd form like a path. So there would be like, um, let me open it up and paint. This was the debrief room, like all the dorms are. There's like a entrance here. Here's the kitchen. Here's the safe. And there's like sofas. On the wall, there's the legends board, right? It's just a piece of paper. And so we're all like sitting down everywhere. And then one of them would stand up and the counselors would generally be in the kitchen or this area, sometimes dispersed around talking to the participants. They'd stand up. And then after we were all done, everybody would get in like a line right here. This is a group of people. Looks like a hot dog. And everybody would get in another line right here, right? And it was, it was kind of thinner. It was like enough for like one person to move in between where they like high five everyone like really close, really close to them, right? With like T-Rex arms, they would high five everyone. And then they'd go up to the top and they'd write their names on the legends board. So after everyone was said, and we had all the names, they'd be like, this person, go write your name on the legends board. And we do a little chant. We like like bang our um, hands against our chest. And we we do some, I, I forgot how the chant went. But it was so creative. And like those same guys who came up with the legends board concept, they came up with all of this. Like they they thought of the whole chant and, and the whole idea of doing this whole thing and everything. And each person would go one by one to uh, write their name with the legends board. They'd walk down the path and they'd be like, thank you, thank you, everyone, thank you. Or they'd dap everyone up or they'd go crazy. They'd start like, they'd go like ape shit, you know? We were going ape shit. We were, we were apes. We were, we were Wall Street bet apes. That's what we were. We were. This was, wa- this was, um, you know what it was very similar to actually? It was very similar to the Wolf of Wall Street, um, like the the thing that the dude did, Jordan Belfort's boss, when he had him at the dinner and he was showing him like what to do with his chest, like that chant that he was doing, it was very, very similar to that. It was like, I think it was almost exactly that. We were on some like primal shit, dude. They'd walk down and by the end of the week, my roommate, who was like shy or whatever, he'd broken out of his shell, so to speak. And he was going down. He was like, yeah, let's fucking go. And he walked down there and the uh, dapping everybody up and the counselor was like, dude, that's crazy. I didn't even know he was like capable of that sort of thing. The people were capable of a lot more than what you might think, but he was really praised. Um, he had accomplished that goal. That was like the whole purpose of why the counselors were even doing this in the first place. And he put his name on the legends board. And um, I remember on the last day we were uh, in the room together. Uh, actually, no, not on the last day. And the day after we saw each other at, at lunch or whatever. And he's like, dude, I'm so glad you were my roommate, dude, for the first week. I feel like it was fate. Like, I couldn't have asked for a better roommate other than you. And and when he told me that shit, like, I'm, I'm remembering I was so fucking proud, dude. I still, uh, that makes me feel so good. It makes me feel so warm and fuzzy inside. I'm really on my Fujiwara Chica shit right now, dude. Like, this is this is how I'm feeling right now. So crying, she's like, I raised that boy. And she's like bruised up from training him. And then she knew me, I was like, what the fuck are you saying? Um, but yeah, that's that's how I felt basically. I was so, so, so proud. And that's actually a great way to be on Legends board. If you, if I, I don't think being on Legends board is, is indicative of all that much, um, unless it's authentic. But if you really want to end up on Legends board, if that's your goal, right? Then all you got to do is be shy and quiet, right? In the beginning, you can just pretend to be shy and quiet if you're not. And then slowly as camp goes on, just start to do what all the other normal people do. And you'll be on it. You'll be like, oh, you broke out of your shell. And you'll be on the legends board. And that actually is, that's easier said than done. Um, I shouldn't, like, if you're faking it, it's easy. But if, if, for, if you're being authentic about it, it's a lot harder to, like, but then again, they do give a lot of leeway. They do really try to give people, they, do, they, they make an attempt to put people on the legends board who particularly are shy so that they can, like, remember the purpose of this camp. This is to get people to be more uh, uh, deeply uh, entranced and, like, the whole smiley community. It's to build like some core memories. This is what this is for. It's to make core memories attached and associated with Ismaili so that way they make sure they raise their kids Ismaili so that way they can also send their kids to Aluma because everybody wants to send their kids to Aluma. Like I would love to send my kids to Aluma but that's probably not going to happen. I'm going to make an attempt but it's unlikely. But a lot of these people are, are looking at it the same way that, that uh, these counselors are looking at it. But it was kind of weird where it would create the situation where like the most uh, active and the most type people, the people who like were actual like legends of the camp, they didn't have their names written down. It was just like a, it was it was unlikely, and they really really had to give it their all. 
uh, to do something to, to have their names written down. They had to do something like some, they had to stand out for like some goal they achieved during camp or some, some event that they won or something like that, you know? But the people who were shy got to be on Legends board, not for like a, a thing they accomplished, but just for being normal. And that kind of put people like me in a weird position where like we had, the people in the middle had no chance of having our names written down because we weren't going to do these things where we go out here and like we win we become like the MVP of the basketball tournament or anything like that, right? We're not going to do any of that stuff. Um, but we're also not about to break out of our shell. None of that's going to change. So we're going in in the middle and we're leaving still in the middle. It's not like we even can break out of our shell because it's not like there's even a shell to break out of. And oh, okay, the thing you also got to know is like, I mentioned to our fans, yes, this is Ohio, right? But it's midsummer, fucking climate change or whatever. I don't know. It's hot, okay? There's no AC. And the heat adds up. It's not hot outside. It's hot inside, actually. And at night, it was just perfect. Perfect weather at night. So we all got fans put in our rooms, right? And my fan in my room gets stolen. But I wasn't in, really in a position to steal anybody else's fan. But I was upset that our fan was gone. Now, it's finally the day where we change our dorms, right? And um, we only got like 15 minutes or something stupid to like take all of our luggage, uh, all of our clothes, all of our laundry, um, our brush, toothpaste, trimmer, our bed sheets, our blank. We had to take our bed sheets off the bed. Uh, we had to take our pillows, um, all that shit, right? We had to take it from one room to another room. We, most people had multiple suitcases, by the way, multiple like massive suitcases. So 21 days worth of stuff. And you really have to take care of everything on your own. Um, because like most, they don't supply you with like any soap, shampoo, any of that stuff. You have to bring everything on your own. And um, you also have to do this in like a short, like 10, 15 minute time frame. Also, while everyone else is frantically doing the same thing in these like tiny ass hallways. That was such a goddamn mess. But you know what? That was awesome. I respect their decision to do that. I, that was very intentional. They should have given us more time if they were, if they were like uh, trying to be safe about it. But like, nah, this is absolutely what you should do. Give people no time at all to do like a monumental task. So um, we had lunch and we're, the moment we get back from lunch, we gotta go back, change dorms, and then immediately afterwards we have some activities, right? Um, so we, we're really on time point. Just not like, it's not like there's just an arbitrary time limit on you and afterwards we're just gonna be chilling. Like, no, we have to leave the dorms. Um, so we have to get this done. So I'm, I'm at my lunch table. This is right before everyone's anticipating it. Cause we go back and we see the paper. Uh, they, they'll tell us who's gonna be whose roommate, right? And we're itching with anticipation and um i'm at my lunch table and and by the way lunch tables are always um actually breakfast lunch and dinner tables are always randomly assigned everyone gets a chance to sit with everyone else and at my lunch table um is this motherfucker named aleem Banjwani. wilburn georgia that's him that's him right here as a kid that's him he was a real ladies man when he was a kid this is him right here wait no i saw that earlier yeah this is him 4,000 followers, True TV, Entrepreneur, Hot Ones, The Game Show, Season, what is this? Wait, is he in this? That's him. That's him right here. Wait, that guy too. That guy, uh, fuck, what was his name? Raheem or something. Dude, he was also at a room with me. It's not like Indian food, I swear to God. It's not like Indian food. <laughs> Bro, of course they got always gotta mention that. Faison, oh yeah, Faison, Faison, that was his name. Georgia State is paying. I didn't even know. Damn, that's a cool picture. Is this? This is long exposure. Is it not? A lot of noise in here. I would do a noise reduction on um on the umbrella. Personally, I think the noise on all this is fine. Oh yeah, this is long exposure. Ah, uh, never mind. It's not as cool anymore. If it was, if it was like taken with a flash. I, I love the colors. I love the colors and the balance of everything. I don't like this. And I don't like this. And this is in Atlanta. I know that building. I know this building. Quarantine 2021. Got my vision aligned. Peace of mind. Thousand. So he's like, he's actually pretty popular. Uh, relatively. In the Smiley community, for sure. He's pretty popular. They were good friends, actually. That's Melissa. I know this guy, too. Uh, and that's Faison. That's Faison. Wait, 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 wait. That's Anomaly. That's... Dude, wait. I was talking about Mosaic earlier, right? That's Eliza or her twin. It was Eliza and Inara. That's an Arjuani, and that's Shreza. Crazy, small world, right? How, like, everybody, you're able to see these people that I was talking about earlier. That's Faison. These two are hella familiar. They also went to Aluma, I think. Hey, that's Anam, 2K. That's Kazan, the guy we mentioned earlier. 
Oh shit! Who is this? Is um Anusha Charania's cousin? I believe that is Ariana. I think I don't know. It's hard to tell. That's Mosin right there. I don't know who that is. This dude, bro. Um, I showed a video of that he was in. Um, when I talked about Mosin, I'll leave that video in the description. I talked about Mosin. He was in Mosin's video. Uh, for like the school thing. That's Unum. That's Eunice. That's Faiza. That's Aleem. Same deal here. That's Mosin. And then that's on the left. That is either Eliza or her. Or her sister. I don't know if she commented on it. And there's Alima, who I did mention earlier. And there's Annie Galani. And they were like best friends. And there's Shanice. Who drew this? Oh, this is just traced. Yeah, no. This is just traced of that. Never mind. I was about to say. Pretty solid drawing. But I, I don't like this picture. I could see how he would like it. I don't like this style of picture, actually. I think it's a fine picture. It's a cool picture, right? I just don't like the style of picture. But yeah, that's him. Oh, old pictures. Ah, damn it. I'm not doing all that. But yeah, that's Aleem. I, I do have this, though. I, I have this. I have this. I think these are on his Facebook page. These are not on his Facebook. Never mind. This is not on his Facebook. This is definitely gone from his Instagram. It's not there anymore. Whatever. He's a kid. He was a kid when he posted this. There's this, which might be on it. Is this like a, a, wall, a phone wallpaper or something? There's this, and this is like at like a, these two pictures or at some like Dandia event or something like that. And actually, uh, I talked about, I was like, damn, this is really, really well tied together. Like you won't get the full context unless you, I'll leave, I'll just leave the playlist in the description, the playlist of all the Ismaili stuff. So Mehek, who I talked about earlier, Mehek Meherli used to date him. Uh, well, like date, by that I mean like, like we're kids, we're like nine years old. Dating at that point is just like, it's just a label. So it means like holding hands, maybe, Kissing a couple times, maybe, if that. And uh, never even going on a date. Like, never even going out anywhere together. Like, never even, like, having a, a alone time or anything like that, you know? But, um, it was still dating, I guess, at that age. I guess I guess that qualifies. But yeah, that's Aleem. And, um, people called him Halim. H-A-L-I-M. Ha ha ha, so funny, right? Halim is the name of a food, if you didn't know. I'm not a fan of it. You can, you can, uh, use, like, meat in it, but usually it's vegetarian, and I hate, like, vegetarian food. I'll eat it, but I'll never go out of my way to eat it. I'll eat it if it's there. But everyone, like, it's his name is so similar to it that I'm like, oh, Halim, Halim. I'm positive. I'm positive he's sick of that. He's sick of the name Halim. And actually, what's funny is, this is all so connected. I went to Mosaic with him as a participant. He was with me. He's in the same grade level as me. And I remember him from Mosaic. I remember a few people from Mosaic. It's just, it's hard to recall. It's easy to recognize. If I see people from Mosaic that I went with, there was a kid named Auber, there was the... I, I remember a few participants that I went with, but not like that. I, I didn't build any like core memories with them or anything, you know? Um, but I remember, I think Aline was with, with me when um, we were participants and we were like dropping like water and like chunks of banana down on like the college students on the floor below us. Um, this was at Mosaic. So, okay, what I was saying was uh, we're at this lunch table, right? And Aline is uh, sitting with me at this lunch table. I remember I'm, I'm talking and I'm like, Yo, dude, the fan that ends up in my room, I'm gonna, I'm gonna protect this fan with my life when I change rooms. Um, and I told him like my fan got stolen the other day, and it was one of the good fans too, cause like there's like two different kinds of fans. It was like the good, like the white ones, the big ones, and there was like the um small ones. You know the like the black circular fans, like the super popular one, like on Amazon or whatever. Um, like the newer one, it would be better, uh, cause it was like faster, but the white one was just like it was larger, but it didn't spin. But it was just larger and it had like a larger area so you could point directly at yourself when you were sleeping and it just felt so much nicer. It was a good fan, I had it in the room, it got stolen. And um, everyone at the lunch table goes silent. And um, someone, I actually think it was Sanisha who said it, who, who was like, she like broke the sound. She's like, yo, were you not here like three days ago? And I must have missed it because Aleem, and maybe they're tripping, maybe they heard it from Aleem. Uh, but not at the lunch table because I, I honestly don't recall him saying this. He told the story to uh, the whole table actually. He was like, oh, I stole this dumbass fan from his room and now I get to have two. So I didn't know this. I, 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 didn't, I don't recall ever hearing that. And I'm confused and I look around and I see Aleem sitting right next to me uh, on my left. He's literally on my left, he's sitting on the chair on my left, literally like three inches away from my shoulder, about to like bust out laughing. And he looks at me and he goes like, uh, my name is Aleem, nice to meet you. And we both start fucking dying laughing, dude. It, you had, it was one of those you had to be there moments, you know? And it's like, dude, I wasn't even mad. What's done is done, right? I only have like another 30 minutes in this room and it's gonna be moving out. Um, and, and when I get to the next room, best believe I'm, I'm securing myself a good fan, one of the good ones. 
And so, um, you know, we're cool. Uh, and we transition rooms, right? Lunch ends, we go back. I uh, see which room I got to be in. We transition rooms. I walk in and who do I see already sitting on the bed? It's this motherfucker, Aleem Bonjuani. Dude, what are the odds? And I, I'm a moment in my mind, I'm like, hell yeah, dude. Best believe we're gonna finesse some fans. And we won't let anybody anybody finesse our fans. Um, and this was one of the larger rooms. It's still small, but uh, one of the larger ones. Uh, and we had three roommates total this time. And um, I walk in and I have a whole bunch of my stuff and I look on the wall where the windowsill is and uh, you're only supposed to have one fan per room, by the way. And the big rooms get a, get a good fan. We fucking have four <laughs> before I even go in. I'm like, damn, dude, this dude was fast. Part of me was a bit guilty. Part of me was like, yo, this is excessive. Like, who the fuck do we take these fans from? But then another part of me was like, you know what? Not even going to quit. Not my problem. Not my problem. I'm going to enjoy this well-ventilated room. I didn't see nothing. So, and the other roommate we had, holy shit, I forgot his name. Oh no, I never thought I'd forget his name, dude. He was so cool. This dude taught me the chant, um, the, uh, Jehanamana Ganagasaga Jekubistu Hoka Jaka, which is like, uh, bro, that's a Hindu thing, by the way. And we're not even supposed to be saying that. Like, we got in trouble for saying that. I don't know where he learned it. I never asked. Uh, people suspected that he may be Hindu because nobody knew him. Like, nobody uh, was, like, friends with him, like, as in Smiley. People thought, like, oh, somebody just snuck a Hindu into the camp somehow. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, these counters can't do laundry for shit. Like, they mix up hella clothes. So, what happens is, this dude, my roommate, he walks in wearing my t-shirt. <laughs> and he kept it, too. And, uh, I mean, it's totally, like, I had someone, I was wearing someone else's boxers by that time, you know? So, and I kept that, too. Um, and I still have it, so... Listen, in the in the heat of the camp, in the moment, everything is like super hectic. It's not really that big of a deal. Like I'm saying it out loud now and it's weird, but it wasn't that weird. Um, everyone got their clothes mixed up like all the time. I think it's just like guys cannot do laundry for 50 other guys. Like a, a group of like 10 cannot do that. No, it's not happening. But see, so yeah, it was a, uh, it wasn't even like weird when he walked in wearing my shirt. It was just like, ah, uh, whatever. Um, and I did let him continue to wear that shirt and then keep it and he left with that shirt But um, both these guys were more on the uh, more on the spectrum of being extroverted and outgoing and whatever um, And Aleem was like, uh, he was one of the like the more well-known kids like people across like the country of Ismailis like other people who who had been to different who lived in different states knew who he was like before uh, they knew him better than I knew him and the other dude he was a he was a troll like me. He was he was a uh, one of the crew, you know. And um, this is this group right here. This is this is a group I can work with, you know. This is a group that I can thrive with. With this group, anything is possible. Like if we if we decide to steal the Oreos, we'll figure out a way to do it. Honestly, bro, I felt like we were on some. The vibe of the air was like Michael Franklin and Trevor type shit. That's what it felt like. And, and you see, at, at this point in the camp, so, okay, at this point in the camp, I had experienced enough of the heat and the fans and the Oreos and that sort of thing, enough to know why my brother gave me the advice he did. Because he told me, four years earlier, he told me, um, he said, the best way to survive a Luma, and this is so, such a little context, he didn't give me any context, um, and I didn't really understand what he was saying. He's like, the best way to survive a Luma is to steal Oreos and trade Oreos for fan time. And in that moment, in that moment, I realized what he meant by that. So yeah, we had Kane, right? Which is like, a, which is church. For Americans, uh, Americans call it like, call it mosque. But for us, it's called like Jamatkana, whatever. And we had like, you know how they say like Muslims pray five times a day? Well, um, Ismailis are a branch of Muslims that, uh, that just kind of make up their own rules. And uh, well, just like all the other branches and just like Muslims in general and just like religious people in general. And we decided a long time ago that nah, three times a day is good enough. I, I don't know, maybe they were lazy or something. I don't know. Where Ismailis, uh, Ismailis consider themselves like they always consider themselves like the superior Muslims. Like the Ismailis are like, oh, other Muslims are not as good as us. They're nowhere near as good as us. Like you will never hear an Ismaili talk about another group of Muslims that has any sort of, even a single trait that is better than the Ismaili community. So I guess uh, the logic there is like, you know, we're, we're better than them. So God will give us a clearance deal, you know? 
buy three, get two free. So um, what it was is we'd go once in the morning, right after we wake up, that's morning Kane, we'd pray once. And then you'd go back to Kane in the evening and pray twice in one session. So day one of having these new roommates, right? And I think it's just the vibe that does it. Like, honestly, I could have done all this stuff myself, which I did. But I, I think it was the atmosphere and the energy around me, the people that were around me that really uh, inspire this. Because before that, I wasn't taking it all that seriously because I knew like, okay, it's way, way too difficult. Unless I'm with the right team, I'm not going to be able to make it happen. Um, I did make it happen on my own, but it's because I was really, really on the lookout now because I, now I was looking for opportunities uh, to steal the Oreos. So the first day after uh, we got our new roommates, right? Uh, we do morning kane, and after morning kane, it's like in this like different building, we walk up hella stairs, and then after morning kane, we walked, we're walking down the stairs, right? And there's this dude in front of me, big dude, he trips and starts falling, let me actually draw it out. So this is my POV, okay? Here is the wall on the left, here is the staircase, okay? And there's a person walking, and he's walking down, and then there's another person walking, and they're walking down, and there's another person. And then down here, like this is the stair steps, right? And then there's like a ground right there, and then the stair steps go again, down. And this is the railing that we're going down, right? This wall is like continued like this. And then there's like a corner right here. Yeah, yeah, this is starting to come together now. And there's a wall like this. And so this big dude in front of me, he trips and he like falls down kind of, but there's a double doors right here where the girls are coming out of. And this is like Ali Bumani, he's right in front of him. And um, he's about to get knocked down because this dude starts falling. He trips and starts falling forward, like his legs go forward. Like, you know how when someone's like sitting on the stairs, like he's about to enter that position where he's like sitting basically. And um, there's a railing right here. But the thing is, is this door is opening and this door like is where the girls are coming out of. Girls like, that's their hair. And, and there's not a line here, it's just like continued and they're coming from here and here. And they're going downstairs and they're like joining us in this line, right? And this dude sees the girls coming out of that door and he just, he catches himself. He like catches himself on the railing and on the wall. And there's like another railing right here. Everybody sees him from like above and below and uh, it's really loud. And you know, it's like a little funny moment, right? It actually was really funny. That was a that was a pretty funny moment of his arms like buckle into like overdrive, right? And everybody is is just like they're not as alert. They're not as, they're not on the lookout the way I am. They're all like, haha, so funny, right? But they don't notice in the corner of my eye as this door is closing. In the corner of my eye, I notice tiny little. It wasn't even like that. Tiny little box. That's what I see. That's what I see. And none of them notice it. Just in the corner of my eye. It's like some, I'm some anime protagonist. I spot, I'm the only one who spots it. Maybe other people spot it, um, but they don't make it known. And what it is, is inside, like in the corner right there, it was, it was actually like right here and the door was more open. Um, and in this area right here, there was a box, a, like a tall box of Oreos. It was like the height of like a shoe box, but vertically. And inside this box of Oreos, there's sleeves of Oreos in there, full length, like sleeves of Oreos, like how you find the sleeves of Ritz crackers in the Ritz crackers box. It was like that. It was eye opening. Like this is what got me interested actually in, in like camp in general. I don't really care about like talking to the girls at camp because I'm not really attracted to brown girls like that. You'll actually find that's a pretty common thing with other like brown guys, like desi guys, which is like what it's called. Like desi guys tend to not like desi girls uh, or rather the ones who live in America. And desi means like the stereotypical uh, Indian, Pakistan, all of that. Like it makes no sense to say, uh, oh, I'm from one of the Istan countries, you know? It's like, we're all just, we're all desi, right? Same shit. Even some Arabs. Like, people in the Middle East can be considered desi, you know? Even uh, people in Africa, people from places like Kenya or uh, Morocco or, uh, you know, places like that, you know? A lot, of, a lot of those people can also be considered desi. They know the same languages, the same religion, all of that. Technically, if you're Indian, you're Asian, right? But name an in find one Indian who says, yeah, I'm Asian. No, it's like two different things. When people think of Asian, they think of one thing. When people think of Indian, they think of another. And when people think of Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and Bangladesh and all these other countries, it's all the, like the very, it's like the same, um, same aesthetic as Indians. So desi is how you describe it. There's Asians and there's desis. And uh, it's like not a very popular, like well-known word, but I think it's, it's gonna pop off soon in America. Like in America, people are gonna know about the word desi. Pretty soon it'll be mainstream, just watch. What I find is that a good chunk, like at least like 50% of the desi guys who live in America don't like desi girls. Uh, especially if their parents are like gen ones, you know, and this is the same for me I had no reason like I grew up with these people and uh, to me like they're just kind of 
I look at these Daisy girls as like very little value, you know? Like they don't have much to offer and uh, they're not all that exciting. It's like, it's they're so predictable in their behavior, you know? They're kind of like sheep. And I'll talk about that a, a, another day. Not sheep in the way that you would generally think, but they're sheep in the way that they like, they all, they're all averages. They copy each other. They copy everybody else. They copy Americans. And I'll get into that topic in a different day. But um, at this point is when I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe I should make friends with a few girls. And um, I made friends with a couple. Afia, Afia was the one who stuck to me like glue though. Wherever I sat, she came and sat next to me. She would like look for me. And she was the one who started all of our conversations. I never started one conversation that we had. And look, I'm not one to jump to conclusions, so I won't. But at the end of camp, when we all signed our, each other's shirts, I wrote some troll shit on her shirt like, oh, uh, it was so nice to meet you. It's such a shame we'll never see each other again for the rest of our lives, but it is what it is. And she was really mad at that from what I heard. Like several girls told me on different occasions that I made her cry with that. But, but I'm not one to jump to conclusions. So who's to say if that even really happened? And like, I wasn't wrong. We haven't seen each other since then. And we're gonna go the rest of our lives without ever seeing each other ever again. But when we were in camp, we had a really nice friendship or uh, an alliance is a better word for it. It was less like a Ayanokoji and Kei and it was more like a Ayanokoji and Horihida situation. Not to say that I was using her like a tool, but if that wasn't part of my intention of talking to her, which was using her to get to the Oreos, if that didn't play into my decision-making, then we would have never met in the first place. She informed me, I talked to her about it and she told me, they all see exactly what I see where, where the Oreos are just sitting there, right? They're not like blind, but they just never try to steal the Oreos. And me and my, I was with a couple of my homies. We were, we're hearing this and we're shocked. It's like a three guys and three girls, we're all talking and we're like shaken to our core. I can't, I can't fathom uh, the kind of person who wouldn't seek the pirate's adventure of finding the hidden treasure under the X, right? It doesn't matter that it's Oreos. The principle of it, the heist, is what matters. It's it's the adventure is what it, what matters. Of um, you know, take what you can, give nothing back. And it, it 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 confused me. It baffled me as to how they could just leave Oreos around everywhere, like the girls, the counselors, and they don't guard it. And um, actually, it doesn't baffle me. I know exactly why. I I, I understand group polarization. You tend to fall more into your extremes than anything else. Um, your, the extremes tend to exaggerate themselves in each individual person and that's why the guys have to literally put it in a locked safe hidden in the basement so yeah it was a uh, I, I understood why but in the moment i was just i was shook the girls not only did they leave it on the kitchen counter turns out i when, when we were talking turns out they didn't even patrol the halls they didn't know that was a thing these girls did not know that the guys patrol the halls and so i asked her i'm like why don't you just go out at night and steal it and she and the other girls that were there um that was with us they were like Huh, we never thought about that. And in my head, I'm like, what? How? But on the outside, I was all calm and caring and shit. <sighs> God damn, I have no experience with girls. This was just mind boggling to me. I felt like I was living in like a different world where like these people are just NPCs. Where like I have to, uh, I, like there's things that they could so obviously do, but only after I talk to them does the dialogue trigger some kind of thing inside them that makes them activate whatever. Like, it just, it blows my mind. It's like these people aren't even real people. How could you not steal the Oreos? So anyways, I uh, got these girls, particularly Afia, but some of the other girls as well, to uh, steal a few sleeves out of that box. And um, that was the start of it all. That was when my crew, my like, I had a crew of people who like didn't really stand out and we would like, we all knew of each other. It was even like, we even included some of the counters in it, you know? Like we, nobody will ever remember us. Not, like we didn't do anything uh, stand out exceptional, right? But we started running shit. That was, this was, this is the catalyst that made it all happen. We started taking over the entire camp behind the scenes and nobody could do a thing about it. Nobody even knew what was happening. And even um, Zerikapa knew about this. Actually, let's talk about that for a second, okay? The counselors, okay? They're Boz and Bais, okay? And Boz are guys and Bais are girls. Um, and it's the opposite to what you say in Atlanta. Like my nickname, Afubai, that would mean like Afu sister here. But this is some tradition from some old language. Generally, Bai means brother. But in, in Aluma, it's like a totally different, it's a totally isolated thing. Um, and you don't call anyone else that outside of that. It's only in Aluma and in some other countries. But Bai in Aluma means female counselor, B-H-A-I and B-A means uh, male counselor, like brother, right? 
Oh, oh dude, I just remember there was this one counselor, a uh, female counselor. There's one by, uh, with this, with such a badass yo. I remember that now. Me and Ali Bamani, we saw her on the first day. We we're sitting next to each other, and we couldn't believe our eyes, dude. It's super rare, by the way, to see a Daisy girl with a fat ass like she did. It's super rare. Like not in size, but like in shape, right? It's 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 a crazy rare sight. Listen, listen. In the mind of a bunch of 16 and 17 year old boys, the 21 and 22 year old girls, they make girls our age look like fucking pennies. And even now, I'm 22. So I'm looking at the girls and I'm like, hey, what's happened? But um, that was never gonna transpire, obviously. But in our minds, we were like, hey, fuck the participants. We want the counselors. It was bad. Actually, the counselors knew. They were, dude, they were 100% aware of what was going on, of what our priorities were. How could they not be? Okay, I don't remember their names. I don't remember most of their names. I remember Aliba, since he's related to AK, who's part of the extended squeeze squad. Uh, I remember Ali Kanba, who talked about like cameras and filmmaking and photography and shit. I remember Noreen Bai. She was so fucking cool, dude. She was like all the other counselors, uh, the female counselors, like they were hot, right? That's what they had going on. But Noreen Bai was cool. She was different and she was my favorite. I knew the other, uh, a couple other counselors, um, like I knew Nabil Ba, uh, he used to give me and Zoib piggyback rides when we were seven, um, I actually have a picture of him, here, look, 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 look. so this is Nabil, it's funny because at camp we called him Nabil Ba, but through our entire childhood we called him Nabil Bai, and that's him, skinny, tall, and that's Faison, classic, classic, I wonder where this is, this is not a familiar location, this is like the fucking back rooms. But I think Faison had him too for REC, but me and Zoeb, actually I think this was the this was the REC class that me and Zoeb really, really became good friends in. And it was when we had Nabil by, and uh, he would give both of us piggyback rides like really, really frequently, like every day. And um, I even asked him to give me a piggyback ride at Mosaic, or at Aluma, and he did. Oh, all right. I'll be fine. So that's, that's me. These are the dorms. This is like the hallway. And I told, I told um one of the dudes, see, we didn't have our phones, so I told one of the other dudes to record. He didn't want me to get on his shoulders. Because, like, I'm older now, you know? I wasn't, like, seven years old anymore. Ready? Ready? Let's do it. Yeah! So, yeah, this was, this is, this is an iconic picture right here. When you were a lot smaller, we could do this. Yeah, I remember like that. Eight times my size. Eight times all the time. But you got this. You can squat now and stuff, right? That's him. That's that's Nabil Ba. That was the last uh, piggyback ride he ever gave us, and probably the last one he will ever give us. I know Zoib's jealous. I know Zoib's seething right now if he's watching, because like he did not get to experience that at that age. The last time he gave um Zoib a piggyback ride was like when when we were like eight years old, maybe. But yeah, that. That's Nabil Bai. I knew him from way earlier. I knew um, I knew quite a few of the, like I knew um, Sahar Bai, the girl like Bai. I'm I'm talking in um Aluma terms. Sahar Bai, uh, she was actually pretty young. Um, I think some of my older friends, like two, three years older, like they knew her, uh, like they were friends with her. She lived in Atlanta. I'd like seen her around in Kana. I never spoken a word to her, you know. Um, and I didn't know Noreen Bai. She lived in like Texas or something. But it only took two minutes for me to realize, like, she's the coolest counselor here, out of the guys and girls. Like, she was someone that I could legit, like, just talk to for hours and hours and hours. We talked about YouTube and rappers and storytelling and music production and video games and, and so much random shit, dude. Some, like, philosophy and all this stuff. Like, our conversations went deep. And, like, the only time that our conversations ever actually ended, like, we would have so many disagreements, but we just worked through it. And it's like, our conversations would never end on our own accord. They would only end when we had to like go back to our dorms or stuff like that. Otherwise, they just kept on going and going and going and going. And she even messaged me like uh, a couple times after camp. In fact, I'll, I'll get back to She like sent me a video. She's like, hey, this video kind of reminded me of what you were telling me about. And it's like some like rap genius type deconstruction video or whatever. But I'll, I'll talk better later because I know there's a thing I have to, have to mention about her. But just know throughout the entire camp, I was developing a, a close personal friendship with her. Um, more than I was with any other counselor. I mentioned Ali Bamani. Me and this dude were doing pull-ups in the showers and 
doing dips in the classrooms. I have a, of a picture of him. And I did mention him in the high school stream. We went to the same high school. He used to live in Atlanta. Um, we had some funny moments together, like the time that he basically threw up grapes because he was trying to like wolf them down. Uh, we were stealing the grapes basically. So it was, it was one of those moments. It was one of those heist moments. And then he like spit them all over the floor. He's like, ah, oh, it's just seeds in it. And uh, that was, I've never seen him, like when he, when he laughs, when he like truly, truly laughs, it's like a sight to behold. This is this is him at Peachtree Ridge. I don't know who got this picture. I believe some Asian dude got it. And this is him at Kane, obviously. But yeah, he moved to San Antonio. Um, and it, he actually got a connecting flight into Atlanta for Aluma. So I saw him there on the same flight as me. In a way, for some people, I was partially a replacement for him when he moved. And you can't just like replace someone, right? It was only a very tiny percentage of a replacement for him. Um, and of course, I, I can't replicate how he was. But I did play a bit of that role for some people. The thing is, is, like he had a lot of close friends and they really, really wanted to see him. And they'd look forward to whenever he'd come back to Atlanta, but they didn't get to see him because they didn't go to Aluma. And I messaged those people and I'm like, hey, look, I, he's on my plane. Actually, let me tell you a story about this dude. This, this is a story that will encapsulate and, and perfectly summarize Ali Bamani's entire being, okay? So this is at Aluma and um, Keep in mind, there's still college students around doing like summer classes and stuff. And in the bathrooms uh, above our sink, there is a condom dispenser. And um, I believe the girls had one too. But it took one dollar and it would dispense a condom for a dollar. And we obviously didn't get any money. Some people brought money, but they took it. They put it in envelopes. They put it in our, like plastic bags into the safe to give us after camp. And this dude, Ali Bamani, decided he would make it his mission. He, he formed a fucking like condom coalition or some shit to where like we would all keep like on the lookout for coins or dollar bills or something something so that we could buy a condom you know not even to use just by the principle of it so over the course of like two fucking weeks we find enough coins like enough spare pennies to where we go and we ask these like random college students which we're not even allowed to be talking to college students to begin with um but we go to them and, like eventually we trade with them for higher and higher denominations to where we finally, we, we asked him, like, hey, bro, can, can you trade me, like, these uh, these pennies for a nickel and all that? And we work our way up till we finally get four quarters. And this dude, Ali Bamani, right here, he's a, he's a player, dude. I got stories about him. He's an actual player. He does the honors. And we're all standing there. And it's, like, me and, like, 20 other guys or so in silence. This shit feels like a damn movie. Actually, it was, like, 10 guys. You can feel, every, like, everyone's, like, anxiety. Like, you can hear the heartbeats. We feel like it's like this dude's diffusing a bomb, right? That's what it feels like. He puts the four quarters in. He turns the thing. A condom drops out in his hand. He puts it in the air. And we're all like fucking cheering like, hey, like we won a war. And like Ali's our war hero. And we like hoist him up in the air. We don't kind of, we kind of, we make an attempt to like hoist him up in the air. And of course, like nobody uses the condom. Like our dorms are literally a mile away from the girls, actually a mile away. And like, okay, that wouldn't stop us if we were determined enough, but you know, the staff also had cars. So if that wasn't the case, somebody might've made an attempt actually. But I mean, this kind of thing has happened before at Luma. Like the stories that have come out of Luma are, are bizarre. Like I could probably bring other smileys on stream and they tell you some crazy stories about Luma. People don't share that sort of stuff with me, but like a lot of shits went down, even just from what I know. It's three weeks with no phones, no internet, no nothing. And you're 17 years old. Like, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think people are going to try to do? Actually, there's not even no, it's no tech at all. Like that's the whole theme of camp. It's literally, we did find radios actually in the basement. So we put them in our rooms, me and like two other people. And we use that to get like news about the outside, but it was only for like a couple days. And we're like, man, this is stupid. We don't even need this. So we put it back. This was a, this camp was like a very desperate, like people, people want to hook up. And you know what? I feel like a lot of counselors, especially during training camp, do hook up. Um, they just keep a secret and they don't let any of the participants know. But it was a super, like super horny camp, bro. We even made lists. Like the guys made a list on the girls. The girls made a list on the guys. Like a ranking list, right? And um, I don't remember exactly how the list goes, but a girl named, obviously I don't remember exactly how the, it's 50, 50 girls, actually it's 49. Um, there are 49 girls and 49 guys. Uh, one of the guys and one of the girls backed out before the camp started, but um, this girl named Sonia was number one on the list. And like, I can understand that. I wouldn't put her at number one on the list. To me, she was a bit too, 
uh, let's just say she had really big eyes. She was really skinny, really short. Not that it was illegal. We were all the same age, but she was just a bit too, a bit too Megumin looking. If you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, there's a reason why Megumin is best girl of Konosuba. I'm not going to dispute that, right? But personally, I'd rather have an Aqua in my life than a Megumin. This is, bro, if you don't watch anime, you're not going to get like half the shit I'm saying. We didn't have our phones, right? They kept our phones uh, in the safe along with the Oreos because that's how badly we wanted them. It's not even that we wanted the Oreos that badly. It's just that when you take that away from us, it becomes a challenge. It becomes a goal. It becomes something fun. Like people do heists in GTA, not because they care about the digital money, like the number they get in the corner of the screen, but because the fun factor of doing the heist. The whole of being without your phone is kind of like, like that's the theme of the, that's the appeal of the camp. Like that's what makes it so fun. That's what everybody enjoys it so much for. Now people who, like the kids who have never experienced life without their phones, they won't understand what this is like, but the idea of having to be bored when you're in a situation where if you want to do something, you can't just escape your boredom by going on your phone. Like it forces you to do something, to like engage in something interesting. I can't describe it to the Zoomers. They simply wouldn't understand unless they've experienced it. And I'm a Zoomer too, but like not really. Like if you want to be technical about the age, I'm Gen Z, but behavior wise, I'm not really a part of that. I'm like a boomer at heart. If you want to experience that sort of thing, you need to not only cut out phones, you need to cut out all like stuff that you basically can't avoid nowadays like politics and all that stuff. Like we, we had to cut out all information about the outside world. It was very, very self-contained. And um, I remember we, we actually got in trouble for uh, talking to the college students. Like, hey, yo, what's going on with this? Oh, who won this game? Who won it? Like we were talking about it. And I remember they like changed us up because they didn't used to do this, but they realized like these, like we're, we have very shit attention spans and like maybe give us a little something, you know? So I remember, um like two times throughout the entire camp. There were two times where we got updates on like what's going on in the world where it would be like during lunch, uh, we'd all be sitting eating um, in like giant dining hall and one of the uh, like main staff members or whatever would like get up and they'd announce, oh dude, one of the, like the, the lead of the camp was actually like my REC, no, not my REC teacher, something like that, like the uh, REC principal or something. And like I knew her beforehand and uh, I, I left a bad impression on her. She knew I was like a undersea mischief maker, you know? She like stood up one day. She's like, okay, we got news from the outside and everyone's silent. But I wait and, and she like tells us that uh, Beyonce had a baby or some shit. Um, she tells us which team won the NBA finals. Yeah, it was actually a really cool experience to get news like that. Because um, instead of where, you know, we're all checking the news on our phone and, and we're all just like very secluded in it. It was like we're all, someone is standing on a chair yelling to the whole cafeteria. It was actually kind of crazy because when, um, it was really cool. I, I like I liked distributing news like this. Because when she said Beyonce had a baby and she said the name of it, all the girls were like, ah, and the guys were silent. And then when, when um, she said which team won the NBA finals, all the guys were either like, yeah, let's go. Or like... Fuck, I lost, damn it. They were like betting each other basically, which I don't know how they bet, they didn't have any money. I think they were betting for the money that they had in their um, envelopes or they were betting like things that they would get throughout the camp. When she said which team won, the girls were silent. So it was super interesting. It was really, really like a, it was a sight to behold. I'd, I'd much rather have my news given to me in a group rather than by myself on my phone and said by some other person, not from, some website or something like that. I think it's a lot cooler. There was a lot of cool people at the camp, like um, Osmir. That wait, 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 that was the guy. That was the guy. That was the guy. Osmir was the guy who I mentioned earlier, uh, the fat dude who was in Mosin's video, who was also in that picture with Leem. I already talked about Ace and when I talked about school. If if I want to talk about him, I'll, I got to go in more depth about him. I got to talk about him in a different stream. So, oh wait, I got to talk about this. Like I said, there's no phones, right? There's no communication with the outside world. No communicating with your family in particular. That like that means something. Because even when you go to college, it's supposed to be like a sneak peek of college. Even when you go to college, a lot of people don't call their parents for like weeks, but there's always this underlying implication that like they could call their parents. But over here, it's like we couldn't. It was like you're off in battle and you cannot, you finally come back and you now is the first time you even have the opportunity to talk to your parents. And I remember the feeling of feeling homesick. That was the first time I ever felt homesick in my life. And I was like, damn, I really, really, really want to go home. And that didn't last very long, but I'm so glad I felt that before I went to college. It really was like a nice lesson to learn. The way it works is like they do let you communicate but only two times throughout the entire camp, once after the one week mark, in between one weeks and two weeks, so seven days in, 
and then once 14 days in, and then after 21 days, they give you their phone back, or your phone back so that you can uh, call whoever you want and you see all notifications, whatever. Um, but you don't even use your phone. What you have to do is you have to remember your own phone number. And if you don't, then they'll actually um, like contact the con or whatever. They'll get their phone. They'll get your parents' phone number, right? What happens is there's this like day on the seventh day or whatever, where um, you finally get the opportunity. They, they take one of the counselor's phones. They go like, all right, what's the number? You say the number, they call it. And th like your family knows, a like people who have done Luma, their family knows beforehand, oh, this is the day he's going to call. So we got to be prepared. You know, we got to be ready uh, and clear our schedule for today because we don't know what time throughout the day he's going to call. So there's like some time that they allocate out and everyone stands in the line in the dorms. And I remember when my brother went to Aluma, I didn't miss him at all. But when my mom got the call from him, uh, she was like, Afraz, come quick. We only have five minutes to talk to Afraz. Come quick, come quick. And she called my dad and everything. And like my mom was like crying and I didn't get it. I didn't really care. Uh, we only got two chances to call and I didn't really say anything during both those chances. But when I was at Aluma, it was a different thing. It felt, it, it didn't, it, it hit different. Even though it was, I was older, you would think I'd be stronger. It was a different situation, bro. I didn't even think about them actually. It's so weird. I don't know why this happened because I didn't even think about my parents. Like a whole week had passed, I had not thought about them once. Like I forgot they existed. And then on that day, I remember feeling like crazy homesick. I remember thinking to myself like, no, I actually want to go home. Like, I actually want to leave Aluma and get out of here and go home. Like, that's a genuine thought that entered my head. And I'm so glad I didn't. But that day we got the chance to call our parents. And so we're all waiting in line. And um, the dude in front of me, his name is Aman Zendani. I believe he was he was like a tough guy, pretty big dude, right? He like freestyle and shit. He was like one of the, um, he was pretty well known, right? It wasn't like a top dog, but pretty, pretty tough. He comes back from the room where you like go into a room. They close the door so you're talking to your parents alone and then he comes back and on his way back he's like he's crying and i'm like yo what and at the time i still felt nothing and then the guy who's in the room he's like all right next next in line come on and all of a sudden out of nowhere it just hit me and i felt like crying right there like right at the spot in, in the spot like nothing was provoked i just felt like crying it, it happened in a second like a blink of an eye i went from not caring at all like I don't even want to call my parents. It's a waste of time. I'll, it'll ruin the immersion that I'm in right now. From that to literally a millisecond later, wanting to cry my eyes out right there. I don't know how it hit me that hard all at once. Like a train, dude. I go there. I'm like holding back tears. And I walk inside. I call my mom. She answers. And what do you know? She's crying the whole call. And so am I. <laughs> I couldn't control it. I don't know why. I cried the entire five minutes that I had to call my mom and dad. My dad showed up like a, a minute or two into the call. I don't think, no, my brother wasn't there. I think she tried to add him, but he like wasn't picking up. Holy shit, dude. I lost so much water during those five minutes. That was actually crazy when I think about it. That was probably the, the most I cried like in a condensed five minute period. From what I hear, this sort of, this happens when people move out, they go to college um, and it's like a one-time thing and they get past it. It happens like three to four days in from what from what I hear generally. But uh, yeah, we were all still in high school. We're rising seniors. Um, some of them are rising, some of the people there are rising juniors, but most of us are rising seniors. In a way, like there's, a, there's another motivation that goes into Aluma, which is like, this is supposed to be like a, a college demo, like a trial run, right? Like a uh, college light. Actually, college wasn't even as fun as this. College was fun, but it was it was not as dense and compact as this. It was more like being outside of college during that time is what was way more fun. In college, you would get like shit on for like doing like the, for saying the smallest, like you could insult somebody in the slightest way and you would run the risk of getting, getting kicked out, especially because I went to art college. So it's like 75% girls, super offended, super literal. Aluma was actually more fun than college to me. Oh, okay, okay. So Lil Dicky Ba, I didn't, Zarek Ba. I mentioned Zarek Ba. Uh, we called him Lil Dicky Ba because he was like a brown Lil Dicky. That's what, that's what he looked like. His full name was Zarek Maharali, uh, and he was related to Mahek. He was actually the first counselor I met on the bus on the way to uh, the camp. And like like I said, there was, um this is a new location, new curriculum, right? This is the first time they were doing like half the shit. So we had a lot of freedom and uh, the counselors, like I said, were just clueless on how to discipline us. Even on like the bus ride there with Lil Dicky Ba, he got mad at me for cussing so much because I was still, I wasn't in the mode of the camp yet, you know? I was still focused on what I had going on and I cuss regularly. So I needed to break out of that habit for that, for that time. But even though he was getting mad at me on the bus, he's like, hey bro, you can't keep doing that. You gotta stop. I remember like one week into the camp, we're walking down a hill and uh, a call student run like, He's like running, doing like a jog or whatever. 
and he bumps into a uh, little dicky bot and um all of us are like we're like oh it's whatever right all the participants that are around him we're on the very like back of the line there's like no other staff there or anything like that nobody to discipline us except for little dicky bot and in front of our eyes for all of us to see this dude this counselor that was like this fucking piece of shit under his breath but we can all hear him and like dude Okay, it wasn't like a clear in my head at the time as to like how they would behave. But now that I'm 22, I know how 22 year olds would behave in the situation. Like they're not that much different from the 17 year olds behavior wise, honestly, in that situation. Like, yeah, responsibility wise, things have changed dramatically from 17 to 22. But in terms of personality, not much has changed, especially with the guys. With the guys, you never really mature as a guy mentally. You're just forced in a situation where you have to act more mature but deep down you never really are more mature you still are the same little kid that wants to uh you know play with toy cars and, and build legos and all that stuff that, that's you are that from the start and you will always be that until the very end um if you're one of the boys that is i mean the girls are a bit different they they were so much more mature than us they didn't steal the oreos and they had all like they would also physically matured at that point like they'd all stopped growing by then so it was kind of weird because you couldn't differentiate between counselors and participants unless you knew who was who. They were actually all blended together. You could not tell. None of the counselors were taller than any of the, except for Noreen Bai. She was like a taller counselor. But other than her, all the counselors like blended in with the participants, the girls. The guy counselors are taller than us though, obviously. What else? What else? Oh, we did Dandia and uh, Mandy. Actually, I still have the Dandia stick from that. If you guys, Mandy is a, uh, you guys know what it is. It's a, uh, a, uh, it's henna. Henna tattoos. They're not tattoos. But, I mean, maybe technically they are. Because they get into your skin the same way, I think. Um, they don't kill certain cells. They don't uh, force certain bacteria to respond in certain ways, which forces them to be permanent. But I think they get into your skin uh, in a very similar fashion. And the thing is, is like in with Ismailis and Muslims in general, and like Indians and all this stuff, henna is a very common thing that people do very often. Or rather, just desis. Daisies do it a lot. And now it's become popular in the States. But like, it's usually in the, our culture, usually only girls do henna. Guys don't do it. Um, sometimes when they're like really little, they'll try it out one time. Like their parents, will, their mom will be like, hey, here, let me put henna on your hand. But that's, that's really it. The guys don't ever do henna when they're older or anything like that. And it's crazy because like, I'm so good with henna. Like I have a fucking gift, bro. Here, look, look. Like I know what the hell to do, bro. I'm better. I'm actually better than old ladies who like do crazy, crazy designs like this. They'd be super precise, by the way, because it's a cone with a pencil and it like sprays out this like, it's like frosting in the way that it is. It's like you're applying frosting to a cake and anyone who's applied frosting to a cake knows there's no erasing it. The moment it shows up on there and you have to make like very thin lines and all this stuff. So be very, very precise. So you won't find any dude's hands on here. It's, it's like a, it's a female thing generally, but there's a lot of complex designs and girls spend hours, hours doing this where like, especially if, uh, when girls get married, they do it to their whole arm. They're, yeah, they do it like this, the whole thing. This is black henna. So nobody does this. Nobody does black henna anymore. It's, it's not good for your health. Like this is not, you shouldn't do that. Just a word of advice. You want henna to look, if you were to choose between it looking like this, which this looks like trash versus this, you'd rather it look like this. But ideally, this is what you want. And this is, look at all the bangles. Like she's probably getting married. Yeah, look at the dress. She's getting married. And this is like how I've never seen that before. It's super, super intricate. And I am a, I'm a beast with henna, dude. I'm incredible. Like my henna skills are next fucking level, dude. And you'll notice that um, nobody will have the same two designs. Every single design is unique, all of them. Uh, they'll generally have very similar uh, styles and patterns. Like this is a very common thing you find all across like this, uh, the flower petals like this. And a lot of times like the more quirky Oh, yeah, yeah, so okay, you will see a couple guys then, I guess. But a lot of times the more quirky uh, people will like shift the flower petals like, ooh, let's point it like that. But like there's certain design principles that people will have when doing henna. Um, I don't follow any of them though. I literally used to put henna on my on my arm every year and uh, my mom saw me do it and she saw me like draw like a dragon and like a super complex flower, like a rose and like the goddamn cover for Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time with like crazy pinpoint accuracy. For a few years, my mom like realized this and she, she didn't go to the old ladies. She didn't go to the aunties to, to have her Mandy done. She came to me for it. I only put like a little bit of Mandy on her every year, like only like small designs here and there. I'm sure I got 
I got pictures. I'll have to look for it, but I'll, I'll show that a different day. But um, when I was at camp, I only did like a little bit of mainly for myself, which like the guys were allowed to do. And like a few more guys actually did do it at camp because it's like, hey, might as well, you know, got nothing else to do during this time, during this like one hour where these girls are doing this. And we had the cones for it. So but I didn't I didn't want to draw too much attention to myself and I didn't want people to see my arm. So what I did is I wrote ATL ho in a giant font uh, on the inside of my arm. So even though it might, I'm saying giant font, it was a giant font, but I was pretty slick at hiding it. And all the participants knew, but I was able to hide it for like two whole days uh, from the counselors just by like being confident. And the thing is, is when it shows up, when it's on your arm, uh, if you have like generally dark color skin, M Mandy, I don't know what kind of Mandy they're using here, but like it shows up really, really bright uh, or not. It shows up like really uh, contrasted uh, on, on your palms. And then it shows up like less contrasted on uh, the back of your hand. And then it shows up less contrasted on the inside of your arm and then less on the outside of your arm and then less everywhere else. So if you want to have the best designs, you put it on your palm, but it's like classic to do it on the back of your hand. That's like where everybody does it. But if you see a picture, this is w with the Mandy still on. Look, 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 yeah, yeah, look. So this is with it dried, right? It shows up so much darker than it does over here. See that? So because my skin is darker than this, um, I was able to just walk naturally with my arms to my side and they wouldn't notice it because of my confidence. They'd be looking at my face, not my arms, not the inside of my arms. So I actually was pretty slick with it. As slick as can be, pretty much. But I mean, like, it only lasted two days. And then they made me wrap it up. They, they were like, oh, what's what the hell is this? And by the way, henna stays in your skin for like, shit, four weeks or so, depending on how much you wash it. You you can wash it as much as you want. The the smallest amount of time it will it will uh, stay in your skin, the quickest you can get it out is like, I don't know, three weeks. That's like the earliest you can get it out, no matter how quickly you wash it. So it, it lasted for like another one to two weeks um, after I got out of camp. It doesn't matter, like you can wash, scrub, dry, you can try, oh, there's so many different methods that people have tried uh, and it only marginally works. It will stay in your skin. I've had henna actually stay on my skin for uh, it, like embedded deeper than it for like a month and a half. So um, yeah, my dumbass didn't realize I was going back to Atlanta with ATL Ho written on my hand. I should have thought that one through a bit better. My parents found out, but uh, they didn't care. I mean, what are they, what are they gonna do? I argue with them and I win. I justify my positions of, of why I do everything. There was this one dude who was dressed like a pistachio one day and it was not intentional. What it, what it was, he wore a beige suit jacket and like a light green t-shirt inside, which is like, that's a terrible combination. You just know beforehand, even though it seems totally natural. Uh, and it looks it looked totally fine. But this one dude was like, hey, this dude looks like a pistachio. <laughs> and uh, from that day we called him Pista, which means pistachio in uh in some language that i understand but i'm not sure what the name of it is it could be one of three languages honestly or all three but yeah we did a lot of fun shit at that camp we did swimming uh basketball dancing yoga yoga fucking sucks dude it's painful dude especially if you're not flexible which surprise surprise i'm not i remember uh the dude slipping and falling into the pool and uh almost like cracking his skull in the process i remember running in the rain for like a mile back to get to our dorms. And um, this was actually on the day that we were like wearing a uh, nice, like we were wearing like shirt, shirt pant, like white shirt, black slacks and all that stuff. We took our shirts off. So uh, it didn't get, the rain didn't screw it up. We would like hide our shirts basically. But bro, actually like running in the rain, shirtless, uh, like with like your boys as a tribe, like that's something you gotta experience, dude. Like people are like, oh no, you'll catch a cold, dude. That shit felt fucking real on a different level. Like that's, every man should experience that. Running in the rain as a tribe with no shirts on. And even then, like, you would think I would be like, no, I don't wanna, I didn't give a fuck. I was so skinny, you could literally see my heartbeat. And even still to this day, you can actually see my heartbeat like pop in and out. That's how skinny I am. But when you're in the moment and you're with the boys and everyone is like, has like a very strong group thing going on and you're very deeply, you've plunged yourself into this sea of, of masculine urges back to back to back and you're shirtless and you're running in the rain at full speed for like eight minutes, all of your insecurities and worries about the world just disappear. You're just in the moment. It's not something that I could describe. You just, you had to be there. People on TikTok are like, oh, that shit hits different. This hits different, that hits different. And they show something like mundane that people do on a daily basis. Like, oh, McDonald's probably hits different. Oh, the no, it fucking doesn't. This hits different, bro. This hits different. Because McDonald's, everyone can go 
to McDonald's. Like that's it's not like a McDonald's Sprite. It's different. It's McDonald's Sprite is different. They have different ratios of of uh, syrup to carbonation. It's not um, pre mixed. They just pour it in directly with the water and all that stuff. It's um it it literally is different. And they pour in a much stronger concentrated sugar syrup because they put in a lot of ice and they know the ice will dilute it over time. So it's only the first few sips of McDonald's Sprite that's different. But it's like people talk about the most mundane things. The oh bro, this hits different. And it's always cringe as fuck whenever I see it because it's like. Nah, that hits the same. You can go there every day and get the same thing. This hits different. Ah, oh, man. There, there's things like this that make you feel like you're just living in an alternate reality. Like things that are like, man, this is what the human experience is, right? This is what, it, this is what it's meant to be. And um, running shirtless in the rain with a pitch black sky with 50 other dudes who are also shirtless for a mile nonstop at full speed. Yeah, that hit different. We didn't run back to our dorms every day. We, it was like a pretty long walk, actually. In general, it was just a lot of walking. It was like a, I'd say we walked something in between like five to seven, eight, like five to eight miles a day, uh, every day, just like going back and forth. Meanwhile, the girls' dorms were right next to the hub of everything else. So yeah, they didn't get to, they didn't get the tradition of everyone slapping the pole in the center of the brick path. There's like this like stump thing and um, they, the counselors told us it was tradition that everyone touches it on like the way to their dorms, right? Um, that like people in the college do that as well. It's like a college tradition. But by the end of the camp, after talking to the uh, participants and uh, talking to the college students, the counselors actually revealed at the end of the camp, oh, it's not tradition at all to touch that like uh, the stone thing in the center. It's tradition for the participants to piss on it. Not for the, for the students, for college students to piss on it. That was a college tra tradition. And the counselors trolled us by saying it's tradition to touch it every time. And we all did that every time. Honestly, being 22 now, I can't be mad at them. I get it. They were trolling. We just they, they do a little trolling is all. They were just participants. There were staff and there were participants who called themselves counselors and there were participants who called themselves participants. They were participants with more freedom and more time to prepare. That's all they were. And, uh, oh, I, the girls also didn't get to experience uh, catching fireflies because the main area where the fireflies like congregated was on our path back to the dorms. And uh, not a day went by that camp where I didn't catch a firefly. I got really good at it. You can't move your hand too fast, by the way. Uh, you move your, your hand too fast, you'll kill the fly. Um, and they'll still light up for like a few more seconds. But actually, even if, if you move your hand way too fast, the wind generated by your hand will push them away. You just got to grab them when they get close in one fell swoop with like uh, the slicing part of your hand basically so that it's very thin so you don't uh, displace too much air and you don't go too fast because timing beats speed and precision beats power. Conor McGregor. Yeah and it's my advice to anyone who actually wants to catch fireflies. It's it's about patience. You don't reach out for them unless they're actually like close enough like like close enough to wrestle with basically. Like close enough to where you can um T-Rex arm grab it, you know? And if they're, if they're any further away, yeah, you can grab them, but you run the risk of killing them. You don't want to kill them. Because what about the next guy? He's going to have less fireflies to catch. Oh, I remember um, uh, the guys wanted haircuts. So people tried to like give haircuts to each other. And uh, there was this one dude, damn, I forgot his name. There was one dude in particular who was like really, really good at it. But uh, I remember he was cutting this dude's hair. And while he was in the middle of cutting his hair, we get called out to go to dinner halfway through. And it was funny as fuck because this dude had like half finished hair. And I believe he got hair everywhere as well in the in the place. I got some experience cutting hair there too, a little bit. That shit's easy, dude. You don't need to go to school for cutting hair. Maybe you do for like, if you want to actually be a barber. But like people think it's difficult. It's really not. It's a very easy thing to do. Oh, oh, dude. This may have been like three days in the camp, three or four days. We had this like session, right? Where we had to make like lanterns and decorations for the Kane. There's like a bunch of uh, participants that are split off into groups and they all have to make different kinds of decorations because there was like the special day of Kane that was like halfway through or like three quarters through camp. And in that session, it was like me, Ali Bamani, Nabil, not Nabil by not the counselor, but Nabil, the fucking, um, oh man, I don't know if his name was Nabil. I think it was. That dude is fucking G, dude. Like that class or that session was hilarious. And it was, there was a few others in there as well. So we're in there. We're trying to, we're trying to draw lanterns, right? We're trying to figure out, well, what do we put on these lanterns? We're drawing concepts, um, on the chalkboard, we're drawing designs, right? The classic, uh, is smiley or not smiley, just the classic, like Muslim, uh, tessellation type designs that you would usually see, like, uh, I don't know, uh, tessellation 
There's a, there's a, there's a lot. But like, yeah, 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 like these, like these kinds of designs. And like the very obvious one is this one, the hexagon, repeating hexagons, right? And this one was um one of the very first ones that was recommended. Like, oh, we should incorporate this kind of design onto one of the lanterns, right? We wanted to draw a bunch of them. I gotta do this in paint because I won't be able to describe it any other way. I believe it was Ali Kanba that, um, see, he's trying to like teach the kids like how this sort of thing works, right? He's trying to describe it to us. Oh, this is how you can make repeating patterns across the whole thing and whatever. He draws out, he's like, so yeah, we can do this hexagon one. And he draws it out literally exactly like this. He's like this, there, he's drawing it on the chalkboard. He's like, you know, we could do one like this. And he's trying to explain to us how tessellations work. And he's like this, and that's how he draws it. That's how it's a drawn on the chalkboard. He's doing this with 100% clean intentions. And so me, Ali and Nabil notice this and we're like laughing our asses off, dude. It's tough to explain to the Zoomers why this is actually so funny. Because like, you know, it's funny, right? But it's like when you're with the boys and you aren't on your phones all day, when your threshold for something that's funny gets lowered and you feel the need to laugh, the stupidest, stupidest things become like really, really funny, like way funnier than they would normally be. Because like this would be like a little chuckle, like, huh, that's funny. But in the moment at the camp, this was like the funniest thing we had ever experienced in our lives at that moment. The funniest part of this whole thing actually was not the fact that they drew this. It was the fact that like the counselors at the front, like Ali Kanba and like this other girl or whatever, like, what's so funny? Like, why are you guys laughing so much? And we're laughing so hard. Like all of us are like laughing uncontrollably and we couldn't tell the counselors. And they're like, do we draw something funny? Do we? And they're looking around and they can't find it. They have no clue. Like they're all, dude, they're blind. They're blind and nobody else saw it too. And after like 20 minutes of, of laughing and them just being blind as shit, Ali is like, hey, hey, stop this. Like he, Ali's actually trying to get us to stop. Like, cause the thing is I'm, Ali as mischievous as he is, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I'm more of that. Like I'm that taken to its fullest. I'm a walking shit post. I am what Call Me Carson would have been if he never got canceled. So Ali's like, okay, stop this. Enough is enough. We have to move on from this. This is, this is stupid, um, immature, childish. Let's move on. So Ali's like, hey, can you guys draw some more hexagons connected to the thing? And you know what the dude draws? <laughs> the dude goes, all right, cool, I'll do it. And he draws this. <laughs> and that's what he draws. And at this point, we're losing our minds, bro. He wanted to get rid of it. Ali wanted to get rid of it. And as childish as we were, Ali was the most mature out of all of us. Me and Nabil were like, oh, there's no need, there's no need. We get the point, we get how the, how the repetition works. And Ali was just like, no, I don't get it. Fill it out some more. He does it to get rid of the dick shape, but it makes it worse. It totally backfires. Man, I gotta ask Ali about this. Like, what, what was he thinking by doing this? Cause like, come on. They don't notice, we notice. Let's have our fun, you know? Why tell them to, to, to fix it up? But yeah, it, um, all he did was just make it slightly longer and taller and give it a bit of a curve. Not only was it a dick resembling shape, it was an erect dick resembling shape. And then at this point, like the dumbest shit, just they were drawn and uh, they were like, okay, so uh, let's do, um, let's put like uh, uh, this thing here and then let's put like a circle here. And they're, they're continuing the drawing on a different part of the chalkboard. And then we'll put like two of these, we'll put two of these kinds of lanterns and they're about to draw this, we'll put like, we'll make two of these kinds of lanterns. So they put like X2, and then we're laughing, we're like, hey, it's X2, X2. We're like losing our minds over X2. I don't know why we thought X2 was so funny, but it was just like, all they were doing was just brainstorming drawings for lanterns. But we were so immersed in the laughter that it made like, dude, when he wrote X2, I fell over because of how funny it was. I don't know why, it's stupid, but that's, that's how it is when you don't have your phones. That's how it is when you have no technology and you're forced to be in the moment. Everything just becomes so much funnier. The life just becomes better. The world becomes more colorful. That's what happens. And that's how it was at Aluma. Mundane things were really, really funny. And this was why. You just, you had to be there to understand. 
oh, this was it, dude. So I mentioned earlier that I changed the meta of Mosaic, right? I also changed the meta of Aluma. You see, a lot of people form traditions here and there, and traditions are formed over the years um, by counters or participants deciding to do something. And a lot of times it's unintentional, um, but the traditions continue on. And I started a tradition that continued on. And it's like, that's a super rare thing to do. I think I was the only participant in my entire camp to do something, to, to start a tradition that continued on. Um, there may have been one more, but only one after that. Maybe, if that. This was never, this has never been done before in Aluma. I was the first person to make this happen, and now this happens every year. So there's a thing called formal night, okay? I mean, I, that's crazy. I, can't, I forgot about this. So um, we were taught one day throughout the camp, like, oh, here's how fancy tables work. Here's how you set the tables and what each piece of the silverware is used for and all that stuff. And it seemed like totally unrelated. Like, what the hell are they doing? I mean, they tell us what to bring to the camp and they told us, okay, bring like a nice like suit or tuxedo or something like that, right? But like, we don't know what is for what, right? So this did not seem to, this was just like some random skill that we learned because we did so many sessions of just learning like totally random arbitrary skills. So we just thought like, okay, this is just some random thing that we're learning. Um, just a cool little skill to have, you know, just in case. Maybe if we're at some nice high society event, we could tell people how we, we could uh, start conversation by like, hey, I know how all this stuff works because we did it in summer camp, you know? Maybe that's what they're doing it. But we learn how to do all this stuff like all the fancy stuff and um near the end of the camp it was like the fourth or third to last day in the camp something like that they tell us to wear our suits when we go to dinner when we go to the cafeteria and instead of going to the normal cafeteria we go down like we go down these stairs these stair steps let me look it up actually yeah it's a pretty pretty large campus actually pathway the pathway the pathway this is it this is the pathway we walk on, um, and there would be fireflies all over the place. And we'd walk on the path, and I'd go, let me catch a firefly real quick. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this is where, this is one of the dining halls. There were several, okay? So outside these doors, there's like another dining hall over there. And this is where that the uh, lady stood up, and we're all sitting at these tables, all these like round tables. This is where the lady stood up and gave us the news that day. Let me, let me look up. So this was another dining hall, and on the left, you can leave. Like, there's where you can go get the food. You can go get the food from out there. So there was this underground uh, lower level. There was like all the dining halls and then there was like this like lower level where you'd um I don't know how to describe it. It was like a private area. We went down there and private seating all of that So we go in a line and I'm in the very front of the line Um, and I'm talking to like Afia or someone right and it's like a whole like it's crazy It's like a ballroom type deal. We're in suits. It's fancy lighting and I, We walk down there. We're in line and they stop us at the very bottom of the stairs Everybody's standing on the stairs, and I'm at the very bottom. I see the counselors, and they're all wearing, like, very fancy, fancy like, waiter outfits. Uh, like, white with, like, um, uh, black around their collars and all that. It was, like, a really, really cool environment. And uh, what they would do is they would take two people at a time, one guy and one girl, basically, and they would seat them where they were supposed to sit, because everybody had assigned seats, or they had assigned tables, rather. And I sat very close to the entrance. I was the very first person to sit down. And this is where... This is where I became a legend. This is where my name belonged on the legend board. This was the reason why. Um, they didn't put my name on the legend board for this, but this is where I took over the entire thing. I changed the meta right here in this moment, okay? So one of the counters, uh, who's my waitress for my table, calls me and says, okay, uh, you're going to be right here. And you know who it is? Fucking Noreen Bai, the coolest one. Not that it really mattered that she was my waitress because... Uh, well, I'll get to that. So, Noreen Bai walks me to my table, uh, pulls a seat out for me, and she goes like, uh, would you like me to take your coat? And I simply ask a reasonable question. I say, take it where? And all the counters start laughing, and it's like, haha, funny joke, right? I get it. Um, but they never answered me. Like, think about it for a second. Like, what do you mean, take my jacket? Where would they take it? I hear people say that in movies, stuff like that, but it's like, what, what if they lose it? What if they don't give it back? I don't know, man. Um, but I'm like, I'm good. So I sat down and um, Noreen Bai says to me, she says something like, something like, I'm your waitress tonight. Uh, I'm here to serve you and accommodate anything you may need. And in pure Disney Channel fashion, in pure like sweet life of Zack and Cody energy fashion, I go, anything? And now, like, if this was any other scenario, if she had said anything differently, if it was not her and it was some other counselor, if I didn't think of this, if 
I had walked in later and there had already been plenty of people in uh, the, the hall, right? If anything else would have been different, this wouldn't have happened. But I go, anything? And the thing is that she's so cool. This wouldn't have happened with any other, any other counselor. I'm so glad I had her as my, as my um, waitress because she's too cool to, to back down. And she goes like, yes, anything. And she plays along. And immediately I go, all right, 10 push-ups right now. And uh, she played along and she did girl push-ups, but like she did it. So that was, that was like, it wasn't even like a difficult thing for me to think of. It wasn't like um, I really put all that much. It wasn't like I knew I was changing the meta. I was just having fun. I was just playing with her. We, me and Noreen had this like little dynamic, you know, where we, we could like play, we could like push each other a little bit, you know? Um, and that's all I was doing. I was just doing what I normally did, behaving as I normally would with Noreen by. I didn't know what I was doing though. And I started this like, this whole trend single-handedly. Nobody else. It took me like 10 minutes before you would see people like demanding the waiter feed them and dance and sing for them and do all this stuff. And like uh, this dude, Nabil or whatever, that funny dude, he got um one of the ba one of the bars to like, cause people were telling, hey, can you feed me this, feed me this? This dude got, uh, he was a table next to me. He got the bot to pour water in his mouth. And so the bot was like annoyed with him. So he like spilled the water on it. I remember, uh, so everyone like with their food, like we all got like different things. We got like nice like steaks and like cheesecake and all that stuff. And I remember I got a side of asparagus. You don't get to decide what you get, but I had a side of asparagus with mine. It was like uh, three or four pieces, right? And I go, I don't want this shit. At this point in time, right? It's, this was like, you know, 10, 15 minutes in and the counters are out here yelling shit, like playing patty cake, uh, like doing somersaults. Uh, and Noreen Bai was supposed to be my waitress, but like that meant nothing at this point. Everyone was everybody else's waitress. Everybody was just all over the place. People would just go, hey, random counselor, do this for me. And they would have to do it. Cause like, I guess they just played along with it. And me and Noreen Bai sort of started this whole thing. Um, so, so I, I ask one of the counselors in my head, I'm like, uh, I'll ask him to take this plate of asparagus and put it on that dude's table to give it to him. And then I thought of a brilliant idea, brilliant idea. This is another meta I changed. So there was this girl at my table and, uh, her name was Iman, just like Pokimane, just like, yeah, Iman, that, that was her name. I know a lot of Imans. I know, uh, at least four personally, instead of sending the asparagus, which I do send the asparagus anyways, but I also go. Here, uh, take this cheesecake and um, give it to that dude over there and say it's from Iman and give the message. Uh, I've been thinking about you ever since the first day of camp. Love, Iman. And Iman is there at my table and she looks at me and she goes, Hey, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. But I go, it's an order. Do it. So he does it. And like he goes there and he, he knows like oh this is obviously not from iman like somebody clearly told him to say this but this starts another trend <laughs> and like two minutes later i receive a giant like stacked plate like filled with asparagus like 20 different people have taken all their asparagus and just been sending it from person to person to person each person adding more asparagus to the plate it's like a giant plate somebody gives me a message it's like oh uh this is um, asparagus for you from your loving secret admirer. This, uh, it, it's like some crazy message that I get. And all the while, this dude over here is massaging my feet. And this particular bot who's massaging my feet would get mad at me for starting mosh pits. And uh, that was the moment where I was like, oh, how the turntables are on the other shoe now. Oh, and the mosh pits, dude. I got to tell you guys about that. So at like Dandia and stuff like that, right? I would start mosh pits and uh, they would all always tell us to stop. They'd always yell at us like, hey, no, you can't be doing that. You'll get injured and stuff. Which like, yeah, that's the point. And now cut to the last week of camp. Dude, remember how I said in the last, well, last stream actually, but that was earlier today. Remember how I said when I was talking about camp, I was like, all of the best mosh pits happen in the showers. Well, it happened again. By the way, if, uh, if you can't be around another man's naked body and you're insecure about that thing, then you're probably gay. Like you're pro you're the one to be suspicious about. Like a real man is not afraid to uh, like, they're confident in their own sexuality. So there's no need to like, they, they know nothing, what, what's gonna happen, right? So there's like five showers, right? Oh, uh, preface, uh, this is a preface I should've done earlier. So the showers were in this like, um, let me open up paint. 
So there's like the entrance to the bathroom and there's like this, which is like the shower room, right? Which there are sinks right here. Here's the condom dispenser and there's like sinks and then there's like stalls. There's like a table right here. We have the uh, boom box blasting music at the CD. Um, and these are like shower stalls with like curtains. And there's like, I don't know, like six of these or so, like five or six of these. And there was like a bar hanging right here, which me and Ali would do pull-ups on that I mentioned earlier. And this was like a whole area, right? Uh, but these were the showers, but like this was like one giant area. And it was all, all the floor was exactly the same. So it was like um, the flooring was like the, the slippery tile basically across the entire thing. It was all shower tile. And um, also uh, with, with the radio here, um, turns out they got the CD swapped right before the participants arrived. So I don't know who did it, but um, the girls got a lot of like, uh, I remember hearing from them, it would play music like Waka Flocka and like Amplifier and shit like that. Um, meanwhile, we had like Taylor Swift and like that one song that's like, uh, don't let me down, don't let me, that one. We had like all those kinds of songs on ours, but we still bumped them though. We got the girls songs, we still bumped them. I'm pretty sure the girls did the same for all the guys songs. But there was one song in particular that was just so perfectly crafted to be a pop song. It was so catchy, yet so annoying, and it would just stick in your head. And the, so the lyrics are so easy to learn. It's like such a uh, geniusly made song, if you think about it. Like, it's not like a beautiful work of art of a song, but it's just such a, oh man, it's incredible, incredible. And it's a uh, Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. It's, it's masterfully crafted to be like the pop song. And I don't want to play it because of copyright, but um, at this point, uh, it was like near the end of camp and there's like, I'm in like the shower right here and there's people in all these showers and there's like four people in line, like waiting for us to be done with it, for a person to come out so the next person can go back in, right? And while this happens, Shake It Off comes on the radio, or uh, not on the radio, it's like a, it was like a boom box and we had, it was a CD. And I don't know why, Shake It Off kept on like, I don't know why it played so often. Maybe it didn't play so often. Maybe all the songs were on shuffle and they were playing as often as the, but like Shake It Off felt like it was being played more often than there's the other songs, probably because of how perfectly crafted it is to be uh, catchy and stick in your head. Even though it's not like a super enjoyable song, it sticks in your head, dude. Like you'll never, I, I know exactly how that song goes. But by this point, we had all heard the song so many times that everybody knew all the lyrics to it. This is actually a brilliant strategy. Whoever switches CDs, good for you. You also deserve some of the money that went to Aluma only for that camp though, not for the remainder of the traditions. And I deserve some of the money as well for starting the tradition of uh, the formal room, uh, the, for the formal day uh, stuff. But when this song came on, I don't know what the hell it was about it, but all of us were like telepathically, we wouldn't even see, we couldn't even see each other, but we all hop out the showers at like the same time. And we're, we're all like on the same frequency, like in our minds, we just communicate telepathically. We're like, hey, you know what? Fuck these showers, mosh pit time. Cause none of the other um, counselors were here. This is only participants. And so we're all, we turn up the volume all the way. We're blasting the shit. And it's like uh, eight to 10 people total. And um, as the song progresses, it just gets, crazier and crazier and crazier. It was like a different kind of mosh pit. It wasn't a mosh pit where like everyone goes all in in the beginning, but it was a mosh pit that slowly progressed and got bigger and bigger. So at first we start taking like the soap bottles or soap bars and like the uh, shampoo bottles and we start like chucking them at each other and like spraying them at each other. And then we take the shower heads and start like pointing them in the air above us, like make it look like it's raining and stuff like that. And then we decided to just completely abandon our safety somehow unanimously we just decided we just agreed upon that without even saying a word like there were no words spoken everything was spoken with energies and uh we just decided that uh it wasn't even like we would abandon our safety it was like we would go we would try to hurt each other we made the decision to make an attempt to go for blood like no less than a severe injury would be an acceptable outcome of the decision we had made what, what happened was there were these like orbies that were like sitting here for like scent or whatever. And so one of the dudes like who was in here, we're all out here, we're all in a mosh pit, right? One of the dudes goes out there, grabs it, and these guys hop in too. And one of the dudes grabs the orbies and just rolls them all over the ground. So you could so easily slip. And like, uh, what, what happened was is like, the only way to really defend yourself in the situation is um, you couldn't stand anymore. You had to start walking on all fours. And uh, the part of the song that comes on um, after that, it's like, uh, it's a, the part that goes like, my ex-man brought his new girlfriend. She said, oh my God, 
I'm just gonna shake it to the fella over there with the hella good. I know the, I know the song. I know the lyrics. I know how this goes. Right after, and and while this is happening, uh, we're like figuring out how do we uh, stay alive and not get our skulls cracked on the floor in this situation. It wasn't that crazy, but it got it got a bit intense after Taylor Swift. She's like, yeah, and she like comes back in, and uh, when the hook. And the hook starts again, we're like lunging at each other for real on some gay shit. Cause dude, like, I don't think I made it clear enough. We're all naked, by the way. And now we're like, we're on, like people are hitting the ground and we're going after each other, trying to like grab each other's legs and trip each other. That's what we're doing. Still bro, to this day, this was the craziest mosh pit I had ever been a part of, ever. That's why this was like, we were so lucky. Cause like, it's only when a camp is deeply religious that they could do shit like this, also as unorganized as they were. Like it's a very, very rare combination that you have camps that uh, participants end up doing shit like this, where, they, where it gets this out of hand, you know? Other camps would never, never get this out of hand. That Christian camp that my cousins are going to, this would not happen over there. Um, well, I don't know, but it's unlikely. And dude, the counselors couldn't do shit. Cause like, they're all out, they're in their rooms, they're doing whatever. They're in the same boat as us. They're clueless. Bro, dude, I didn't even mention, the counselors stole Oreos. And that, by the way, when I ran out of Oreos that the girls gave me, that's how I stole the Oreos. I went into Lil Dicky Ba's room and Ali Ba's room, they had a, they were roommates or whatever, and I searched their whole room. And I stole the Oreos from them after they stole the Oreos from the staff. Actually, I stole a lot more, dude. It was me and my whole crew. Like like I said, we had our, we had our, our like middle crew. We stole gum from in between the couch cushions that uh, somebody showed me, he's like, hey, don't tell anybody it's gum here. Yeah, I didn't tell anybody. I just took it. You shouldn't have told me. I stole the gummy snacks that were in uh, Lil Ducky Ba's room. I stole a popcorn, which is like, that's not that big of a deal. You could get as much of it as you wanted. But I stole the ice cream sandwiches from when we went out and we bought them um, at like the mall and stuff. We bought like boba and all that. I stole the uh, cookies and cream ice cream, like the whole pint. We had a pint of cookies and cream ice cream that was gonna be distributed later. Me and my crew took the whole thing. We took the popsicles. There was like the outdoor field day that we had and it was like the rainbow popsicles. Um, we stole that as well. We stole sugar cookies. Not the sugar cookies that are like the frosted sugar cookies, but it was like the sugar cookies with like bits of uh, sugar crystals on them, but they were still great. Honestly, dude, I think I like the sugar, both those cookies equally. They're just for different situations, you know? Dude, on the last night, we had so, we had a fucking feast, dude. Like we, we took those, um, we went to the fridge, we took like the glass bottles of like Starbucks coffee. Like I said, at this point in camp, at the very end of camp, we could sneak out because we were awake. We had energy. The counselors were drained. So they, they, would, they wouldn't patrol the halls nearly as well as they used to. So we went out and dude, those glass, like the, um, these Starbucks bottles, these come in so clutch, dude. Like they're, I look at this and I'm like, I, I have a craving for this right now. I literally have a craving. I want this badly. These keep you awake. These are like a productivity drug, productivity drug. And it's, um... I haven't tried any other flavors. We had mocha. I had mocha. I think there were some other flavors there. Caramel. That's my favorite. I want to try these. I want to try these. I'm literally about to... Okay. Okay. I'm getting these. I'm getting these. I'm going... Amazon? Not on Amazon. I want to go get them now. Walmart. All right. Um, after the stream, I'm going to Walmart. I'm getting these. But uh, yeah. Okay. What was I saying? Yeah, dude. We, we took these glass bottles. We took all the food that we had. Hella ice cream. Um, just like hella snacks that we got. All the like the fiber one bars, which at that point were like a delicacy, you know? Because it's like the only sweet thing we had. Because like the fiber one bars that had the chocolate chips on them. Those were awesome. And they give you those intentionally. So that way, you know, for obvious reasons. But um, like me and like the five other dudes who were part of my crew, we had like the meal of our lives that day. One of the best meals I've ever, no, that might've been the best meal of my, of my life. It was just, it was food that we hunted for. And I remember we had it in the counselor's room cause they had a bigger room. So we went into the counselor's room. We were like sitting and stuff on their bed. We were like chilling, talking about life and stuff, eating all their food. And the counselors walk in and they're like, hey, what the hell are you guys doing here? Where'd you get that food? Give it back and go back to your rooms, it's like 4 a.m. And this was on like the second last day. And we just told him straight up, we're like, uh, we stole this food and you guys can fuck off. And we literally said that. That's like the exact quote of what we said. I mean, like we had strength in numbers. So like, what are they gonna do? Two counselors, six participants. I think it might, there might've been seven actually. And we're nearly the same size. What are they gonna do, report us? 
they were the ones stealing all this food from the staff. We're, we're Robin Hood. We're giving food to the, to the poor and needy, aka ourselves. So uh, at, at that point, they were like, you know what? Screw it. Whatever. We'll just eat with you guys. And they joined in on our feast. And by feast, I, like, it really, we couldn't finish all that food. But we did anyways. I think that was probably the highlight of camp. It was just all the shit that we stole. We stole, uh, actually, it wasn't even us that put back the radios. It was the counselors that found the radios in our rooms. They were like, hey, uh, what, why the hell do y'all have these? And they took them. Um, but we stole, like, balloons. We stole hula hoops. Uh, we stole super soakers. These were all part of, like, activities that we had. Uh, we stole a lot of silverware for no reason at all. I don't know why. It was just really... We were just menaces, bro. We were menaces to the camp. And none of them knew. This is what I mean. We stayed low-key, and we did all this shit, and it's like, if you have a spotlight on you, you can't get away with this, because people will stick around, they'll follow you around. If you say, I'm gonna go to the dorms when everybody else is, you know, gonna do these activities, people will follow you into the dorms, unless you're someone who flies under the radar. Then you can go to the dorms, get a nice shower in, uh, what's it called, like, plan out, do like a GTA heist mission where you go into, like, Lester's room and you plan out how the heist is gonna go, you do all this stuff. If you stay under the radar, you can get away with stuff like this. And I knew that from the beginning, which is why I did it. And that's also why nobody from the camp probably remembers we did half of this shit. They probably don't, ha they probably have no clue because we kept it low key. We didn't tell anyone. It's only like half the guys know we did this shit, but they don't, I don't think they know like specifically who. I don't even think they remember our names. And uh, like the counselors knew that we were doing this because like they, like they would check the fridge and they'd be like, dog, where the fuck did all this like boba tea go and all that. So um, nobody, I don't think any of the girls especially expected that uh, this sort of thing happened. I don't I don't know if they knew, I don't know if anyone told them. I mean, all the people who were like getting in trouble were like the extroverted guys, you know, the ones who stood out. But I didn't stand out. Me and my friends, I I'm tying it all back now, bro. We secretly ran shit behind the scenes and nobody knows it was us. And I guarantee you, none of the girls, except for, except for maybe like Afia and like two out of the four Anushas and obviously like, like Alama, but I'll get to that. But other, other than, other than like a few of the girls, I doubt any of them remember who I was. I think if you were to ask them, they would literally not even recall me being there. If you were to show them my face, that's how low key I was about it. But yeah. And of course we were the guys who took over. Like this is usually how the shit goes. This is how life works. This is how mafia works, bro. So I think, is that it? Uh, I know there's more. What else? What else? I started the trend of what did, what people do on formal night. Camp 2 of 2017, they heard what happened and they copied me and they've been doing it ever since. I gotta ask uh, my cousins who are at Aluma right now. I have two cousins at Aluma right now. I gotta ask them if they ended up doing it, if they remember the trend. Because it's like telephone. Sometimes these trends die out um, and somebody needs to revive it. Somebody needs to let them know what happened. But yeah, my name belonged on Legends board for that. But okay, wait, wait. That night that we had our feast, actually, uh, we went to the debrief room and we took it upon ourselves because none of us had our names on the Legends board, obviously. We, we, we were low-key. And uh, there was an empty space on the very right of the Legends board. I wonder if there's a picture of it somewhere. Um, I'm sure somebody... Camp 1, Aluma, 2017. Someone find it. Yeah, there was like a huge space on the right. So we just decided, hey, you know what? We're going we're gonna to take it upon ourselves to write our names on there. And um, we all did it. We all put our names on there. Uh, all like... 10, 10 to 12 of us. At that point, it was like 10 to 12 of us. And we basically recreated the same thing, like the chanting, like the, uh, like the, uh, like banging our fists against our chest and stuff. And uh, I was the first to write my name on Legends board and I put my name bigger than anybody else's, not just out of the crew that we were with, but bigger than anybody else's in the entire, on the entire Legends board. Oh, I wrote my name the biggest. I, my name was like the John Hancock of that board. And uh, by the end of it, like people at the camp knew I'd never, ended up on the legends board, even though I probably should have. But on like the last day when they put, when they took the board off the wall, uh, everybody was there, it was like, it was like the morning and like the buses I ride and everything. And we're looking at the board and the counselors are like, bro, Afraz, what is this? You were never supposed to be on here. Why is your name three times as big as the next biggest name? And like, it's just cause I'm built different, bro. I didn't say that, that wasn't a meme at the time. But um, I had some cool comeback. Oh wait, I didn't even talk about, okay. So first week I was with that dude. Second week I was with Aleem and the other dude. So third week, um, my roommate was none other than the infamous Ahil Rajbari. And I don't even need to say much about him. One of these days I'll get my cousins, um, Ali, Alia and Chifa and Chinaya maybe to like come talk about him. Damn dude, I'm randomly like recalling stuff here and there cause I'm in the, I'm in the zone now. 
but I know I'm forgetting a lot of stuff. There was just so much stuff that happened. I can't remember it all. Like visiting the mall, there was hella shit that happened over there. Experimenting with the most efficient way to eat the Oreos. Cause like, um, like here's the thing. I know how to eat Oreos the best way. Cause like we only got two a night. We got a small, like basically shot glass of milk, kind of. And so what happens is like, it was like one of those plastic cups, like the uh, short ones that people usually have for parties and stuff but like for like younger people and uh, people like pour punch in them and stuff like that, you know? Uh, we would experiment and we'd try to figure out, okay, how do we extract the most sweet flavor out of these Oreos that we possibly can, you know? Because there's not an abundance of sweet stuff here. So we got to figure out how to, how to milk this pun half intended. It was intended as I was saying it, but um, we got to figure out how to milk this for as much uh, uh, flavor as we can. So here is a strategy, okay? Here is, here is the meta for extracting the most value out of two Oreos and a cup of milk. So what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna take the cup of milk, you wanna take the cup of milk, here's the cup, right? And the milk is like this high, okay? And you wanna take the Oreos and you wanna dump them in there, dunk them in there completely. And our Oreos were just big enough so that we can have it vertically like this. So I'm gonna draw it out with black like that. So that's the Oreo and we could dunk it in and it was like right up against the walls of the cup. It was like just barely up against the walls. And we just leave it there the whole time. Do this like for the first Oreo. And then what we would do is we would take it, we'd pour it. And as we're pouring, we get like half the milk in our mouths. And we'd also get the Oreo in there. And it was just soaked and it like melted. It melted in our mouth. Try it. If you haven't tried it, that is the best way to eat Oreos. To get the most value out of it. Now, I have to explain this to people and they don't get it. The thing is, is like if you're in, in an environment where there's an abundance of sweets, I think you'll think this is gross. Even if you try it, I think if you try it, you'll think it's a gro it's gross. But if you eat sweets very uh, like sparingly, if you're very sparse with it, um, and you only eat like sweets like once every couple days, every every week or so, and you try this, and then you take a second Oreo, you dunk it all the way, and you sink it as much as you can, and you let it like melt in there basically, and then you like take a shot basically of the whole thing where the Oreo falls into your mouth and it just melts in there. That is, oh my God, heavenly, heavenly. It's it's way way more uh you're extracting so much value out of the oreo than you normally would if you were just uh eating it normally and you were just sipping on the milk you know it's like you're getting the value of like six oreos and just from those two oreos but yeah that's the that's the strategy it's not like super gross like it'll retain its shape and you'll time it right to where it retains its shape uh, even when it falls in your mouth but once it rests on your tongue uh you could press it up against the top of your mouth and like just crush it super easily um, because of how much is soaked in there. And then you could drink the rest of the, like the few drops left of milk in the in the cup. People would go crazy. Like they would like lick the inside of the cup and stuff like that just to get like the tiny bits of galactose, like just the little bits of sugariness they get from the milk, you know? Cause we only got two per night. And those, uh, the experiments that we did paid off. We did plenty of experiments on how to get the value out of it. And those are our findings. So you can learn from the, the labor and the effort that has been put in by the people before you. If you're going to Aluma or if you're doing something like this, this is how you do it. Oh shit, wait. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'm leaving out. Chaddi Patrol. Chaddi means underwear, okay? So we had this thing called Chaddi Patrol. The guys had uh, made a plan. There were a couple people who were like part of the crew, right? Who were part of the middle squad. Actually, they weren't part of the crew, but they were, they could have been. They were in the middle where it's like, they're not, um, they're kind of on the fence. They're not like super introverted, super extroverted. And they're, they're talking, they're like part of a different crew, like Daniel and them. They come up with this idea. Damn, this is so, I hate how like all the best ideas I never think of. So they think of this idea to do um, Juddy Squad, okay? And Juddy Patrol. Like Juddy Squad will do Juddy Patrol. So the plan is on the very last day, we all at night, we just leave the dorms, right? We just break out and we walk all the way to the girls' dorms, which was a mile away. And uh, they were like telling us, hey, so what do you think about this idea? What, what do you think? Dude, I'm thinking about it. What the hell were we thinking? If we did that, we would have like gotten Aluma shut down. Like that would have ended Aluma. There would be no camp too. There would be no other camps. The entire institution would have closed down. Oh man, uh, they found out about it. They stopped us, but like, we still had Chaddi Patrol in the guys' dorms. Dude, if they didn't stop us, we would have done it. We actually, we were considering doing it. Like, we, we wanted to do it. In my mind, I was like, yeah, this is totally happening. What the hell was I thinking? Oh, man. 
But um, because it, it, it was more contained in the guys' dorms, it was a bit different. It was not like it. It, it kind of devolved because like we were already in that like um, we're animals, you know, we're in that primal state. So we just decided like, all right, fuck it. The art of warfare is calling upon us tonight, and uh, we just treated it like a video game, and and it it turned into more of like a um a war more than a patrol. It devolved. It it just devolved. People were taking shaving cream. And like slapping each other and like waking them up. This was late at night, by the way. Um, there were dudes that were like taking clothes from people's bags and like throwing them in the hallways, mixing them with other bags. Everyone was very quickly quickly woken up by this. Uh, people were like wrestling in the hallways. We were all in our underwear, so it was like Juddy Patrol. Like it, we kept the essence of it the same, but instead of going to the girls and uh, like ending up on a registry or something like that, we just. Uh, we did stuff that would uh, that would traumatize the girls if they saw. And dude, the staff was too unorganized for them to stop us. We had strength in numbers, and we all knew that by that point. We didn't even need to say it. They knew it. We knew it. There was nothing they could do about it. I was part of uh, two teams that, that day. So there was the Hangar Militia and the Razor Repertoire. And there were several teams. Um, so the Razor Repertoire, they would take razors. Um, not No, they would take trimmers, not razors. We called it the Razor Repertoire. I don't know why we called it that. We, called it, we should have called it like the Trimmer Team or something like that, you know? But the Razors would have been crazy. That would have been so overboard. Not that this was not already overboard, but the Razor Repertoire would take around trimmers and try to cut people's hair, like from behind and stuff without them looking. Um, we just like run to people, turn on, go like zhoom, at their hair. And um, uh, yeah, that would, yeah, people got mad at the Razor Repertoire. We, we, we had a bad name for ourselves. But the Hangar Militia was, um, it was a little less... Chances are, um, if you get hurt by the uh, hangar militia, it would hurt physically, but it's not something that would be like long lasting, right? Because all they would do is they would use hangers as ammo. So they'd go into the rooms, steal everyone's hangers. And once again, this dude, Nabil, bro, funniest dude ever. He went, um, he was having a hangar battle with like someone from across the hall. Um, and that was one that was like, okay, no, no, I'm going downstairs. Um, I'm not about to be a part of that one. That one in particular, man, I should have been a part of that one. That one seemed like a really fun one now that I think about it. But um, he was having a hanger battle. They were like basically like throwing hangers uh, from one side of the hall to another. And one of the staff members who is like um, the scholar, right? That's what they call him. And he's like the head, like the staff member. He gets the biggest room in the whole place. Um, he's like the head educator, basically. And he's like the person that the Smiley Institution sends like, hey, your job is to make sure that these people fall deeper and deeper into the, into the cult of being a Muslim, into being an Ismaili. That way, they continue to give us money and give us 12.5% of their income for the rest of their lives. That, that's like his job, right? So he, he probably gets paid a lot. And um, it's like you weren't allowed to talk bad about him. He was older than everybody else. Uh, everybody like respected him. He was like the, he was like the uh, Dumbledore of the crew, right? And I remember during this moment, he opened his door during this fight. And one of the hangers that Nabil threw just like skimmed right by his face. Oh my, I'm thinking about it now. Like at the, in the moment we were like, hey, it's, it's not, it's whatever, you know, it's a occupational hazard. But if it hit his face, like if it actually hit his nose or something like that, this is an old guy, bro. Nabil probably would have got sent on a flight back home right there, like right on the spot. People would have stopped and he would have been sent back home. Oh, and for like 20 seconds, I was also the flag carrier, which is like, there were a couple major flag carriers, but they let me uh, be the flag. I was for like 10 seconds, which meant I was walking around during battle and I held up the um, boom box above my head uh, while I was playing music, while everyone's battling it out, you know? And like, if you're the flag carrier, contrary to what you might uh, think flag carrier might mean, nobody's touching you. You're, you're exempt from the horrors of warfare. Uh, if you're providing them the music uh, to, to be the catalyst for their primal desires to come to the forefront of, of their intentions, you know? So so they, they don't touch the flag carrier. You, can't, you you become immune, basically. That's like the base. You become immune if you're the flag carrier. And I was able to be the flag carrier for like 10 seconds. Not everyone was able to do that. I'm glad I got to do that. And I remember the girls heard about this. And they were like, we were on the bus with the girls, like going back, uh, going to the airport. And the guys were like telling them about it. And they're like appalled by the news and we're out here like high-fiving each other like celebrating a great victory it's crazy because this couldn't have happened at any other camp before or after because before they had everything down they were very strict on stuff and after is when they finally got things figured out and they said oh no we can't let this thing happen again i mean like i say that it couldn't happen at any other camp but when i think about it 
It was me and my friends after all. I'm sure in any other camp we would have found a way to make it work, no matter how strict the staff were. I don't think Juddy Patrol would have worked. Um, I didn't think of that idea. I wish I did, bro. It's all the best, like, best roast, best ideas. I never end up thinking of them. I only think of, like, good stuff, never the best. But, um, yeah, I remember uh, all, the, all the songs we'd sing, uh, playing all these games on the bus, uh, bus rides to these field trips. Um, I remember, uh, uh, what's it called? Exploring Kane. Uh, we found plenty of rooms to, like, hook up in that we wouldn't get caught if we did. Me and me and these girls would, like, explore quite a bit, and we'd, like, write all this stuff on, like, the chalkboards of these other rooms that these students were about to go into. And I wasn't about to... Look, there's a few things, few things you gotta understand, okay? I'm out here, I'm exploring, and these are the girls that I'm, like, um, talking to about, like, uh, the Oreos and stuff like that. I'm trying to become good friends with them to get the Oreos. I'm in these rooms with, like, Afia and stuff like that, and girls like that, and it's like, there's several things you gotta know about me. Number one, I have standards that are way higher than myself. My standards are way too high, okay? To me, I'm, I'm a fighter, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll chase, you know? I'll go for the top spot. I'm like an athlete at heart. If I had different genetics, I would totally be an athlete. To me, it's number one or bust. That's it. There's nothing else. And Sonia was number one on the guy's list, like agreed upon. I wasn't all that attracted to Sonia, but if it wasn't Sonia, it wasn't going to be anyone else. It's not even that I wasn't, like, it's by principle of her being number one, the being the most sought after, being like the top prize. Like, that's the only option that I'm going for. And I believe she already had someone, if I'm not mistaken. That was kind of a stupid decision for people to put her at the number one spot. But it's not like the dude was there, so. And besides, girls cheat hella in these kinds of situations on cruises and things like that. We were talking about the other day. If, um, if your girl goes to a Luma without you, I just break up with her on the spot. Like, girls have needs. And they're going to satisfy those needs one way or another, with or without you. So, yeah, if you're not there, you're getting cucked. That's really uh, as harsh as it is to say. I'm going to put it bluntly. That's straight up what's happening. This kind of thing happens at Aluma, though. Like, my roommate, my roommate in the second room in uh, for the second week, not Aleem, but the other guy, he had someone. Like, this girl had a crush on him. I forgot his name, dude. Why do I not remember his name? Uh, but, yeah, there was this girl who, like, a week into the camp who, like, confessed that she liked him. And they, like, stuck around each other. I, he didn't care. He was, like, an anti-simp, bro. He would just go wherever he wanted, do whatever he wanted, hang out with the boys. And she would just follow him around everywhere. It's not like he, like, ever turned her down or anything. And I believed, if I remember correctly, they hooked up in the airport before their uh, flights back to their respective cities. So it's like they had a flight to one city. And then before their flights to their, like, before their connecting flights to the other cities, uh, they hooked up before that in that airport. So, um... Like understandable, airports uh, double your ranking immediately. So if you're a, if you're a five, you're a ten in the airport. That's that's how it is. Airports are just different like that. Yeah, we'd go around Kane. Oh, I gotta talk about Kane. So um, the way the way it worked is um, Kane, like I described earlier, is where is like the church, right? So we'd go up, we'd say our prayers. There'd be people sitting in the front. That's the Muki Kanria, all of them. We didn't say the like the normal like like you're supposed to go up to them after all the prayers said. And like go to to one of them and go like oh you're supposed to say you're like do do a prayer right but we were like they couldn't hear us because we were all quiet and we were like uh titties ass titty like we would just say some like random shit and like they'd have to look there and they'd be like yeah 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 i mean i mean like and and, and like it was so it was so like that was actually really funny doing that and i think the counselors knew we were doing that but i don't think they ever had any proof because it's not like they could it's like a very sacred, uh, quote unquote, environment. They couldn't like get up and like stop us and like tell, like if you mess up something, they can't tell. It's it's even ruder to tell someone to like stop or something like that. You might as well just like let it happen, move on and just be done with it. You know, that's sort of how Kanye works. It's like a very, uh, I don't know what kind of environment because I see videos of churches like in movies and stuff like that, like Christian churches. Um, it's not like that at all. It's a lot like it's uh, separated by gender and stuff like that. It's totally different. We did a lot of, uh, you hold the person's hand while you're saying the prayer, and we would, like, tickle their hands and stuff like that, like, pinch their, squeeze their hand and stuff, play thumb wars and all that. And that's what it's like without phones. You just find ways to have fun, and you'll find ways, and ultimately those ways you find are much, much more fun than anything you could do on the phone. But the Zoomers wouldn't understand, unless you've, like, been on a cruise or something. I forgot to mention, we, like, put the lamps, uh, the lanterns and stuff that we made uh, for the important day. Um, this was like the fifth or sixth to last day of camp. Um, it was like just in the week three. 
That's when we did that thing. And remember, this is around the time where Chuddy Patrol was like really starting to uh, uh, go through the rounds of people and, and really start to like uh, pick up steam, you know? The idea of it was starting to pick up steam. Now, uh, the plan was is Chuddy Patrol was supposed to go into effect on um, the very last day. This was starting, we're building up, we're building up. But at this point, like the fact that we were even talking about Chuddy Patrol means that we knew, like we had strength in numbers. And our behavior reflected that for sure. It's uh, like I said, it's a very um, like sacred, it's a very like, you have to respect everything, you know? Like you, it's a very serious, serious is the right way to describe it. It's like a, you have to take off your shoes before you go inside. No shoes ever. Like no hats, no hoodies, no shoes, no shorts, uh, no flip flops, um, no exposed feet, like none of, you have to be wearing socks, uh, no phones at all, no talking, uh, not even whispering. And it's weird because like, to me growing up, this is totally normal. But when I would tell like, people at my school who are like Christians and stuff about this, they'd be like, damn, that sounds like some extreme, because in church, like people whisper and stuff, like even adults, like the parents would be like whispering to each other, like, oh, there's, and people are on their phones and stuff nowadays, but it's like, and, and people are not separated by gender and all that sort of thing. It sounds barbaric when I say it and people think it is, but to me, this was like a, just a totally normal part of, of growing up. This is just how it was. I don't think it really had any impact on like any sort of ideology or anything like that. I mean, I watched movies and things like that, so that's what took up the majority of my um, learning morality about the world and stuff like that, you know? But yeah, that's it was a very, uh, very old school style of doing things. And um, even if you like whisper a little bit and kind of like a oh, tiny bit, you get removed. Like they take you out um, and they, they put you to the side or they put you like very, very far away. And and in kind of like actual, actual kind of, like not over here, but like in real kind of, you're allowed to like sit with your family and things like that. Sometimes if you're really young, like young boys, like all the kids will basically sit with all the women. If you're below five years old, it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl, you're sitting on the girl's side. Uh, the guy's side is like only for guys who are like five years old to seven years old or older. And even then, like you could be seven, eight years old and you could still sit on the girl's side, but it's very, very rare. It's a rare thing to see, but you could still do it sometimes. You can kind of, uh, make situations where you sit with your family. I've seen on some occasions where even like the parents will sit on the opposite side, but it's like a very, very respectful environment. So um, nobody will ever say anything as long as it's like a one-time thing, you know? It's never a recurring uh, occurrence. Over here, there was nothing like that. So if anything, it was even stricter. And um, on this day, it's like we, we knew we had strength in numbers. We knew about Chadi Patrol. We knew what was coming. We had a plan for it, and this is like an important day. So picture church, but like way, way stricter. And we're all about to go inside. We're, we're uh, all the guys are like in the room where we're taking off our shoes. We walk in a single file line. There's no talking whatsoever. Everybody has to be completely silent, even before we walk in the conic. And now this guy is like, um, we're talking amongst ourselves. We're like whispering, and this counselor is getting mad at us for whispering amongst ourselves. He's like, hey, stand straight in line. Stop talking. And we were talking about Chuddy Patrol, actually, which is funny. He didn't even hear it. Maybe if he didn't say anything, he could have heard about the plan and they could have been more prepared for it. And now, now picture that atmosphere in your head, right? Picture that atmosphere. Complete silence. All you hear is footsteps. And uh, people are saying prayers in um, Arabic over the intercom. This is like straight dictatorship. Like, think about, think about like how you see it in movies. That's like how it was, right? It's like very, very single file, dictatorly like. And one participant who's like with us, he's like two feet away from me. Uh, after this dude criticized him, he's like, hey, stop talking, stay in line. This participant yells out full volume at this at this counselor. He's like, hey, watch out, we got Hitler over here. <laughs> and everyone just starts dying laughing, bro. The counselors are laughing. The girls will hear us from the hallway, they're laughing. Like, we, we did not take Connie seriously at all. <laughs> oh man. In that environment, that was just, that was the perfect thing to say in that environment. That was Daniel, by the way, who said that. He get, he put gel in my hair. That was the first time anyone's ever put gel in my hair. That was the first time I ever had gel in my hair. And um, I remember in Kanye, we all like, everyone has to do like a bunch of stuff. So we all take turns doing stuff so that way no one like is exempt. No one can be left out of anything. And it's like, we hate it. You know, this is, this is not the kind of thing that we want to do. It's like, oh damn, it's my turn to say dua. I guess I'll just get it over with. We're kind of hoping that will be one of the participants because they were unorganized. Not every participant had to say dua. We were kind of hoping that we didn't need to be the ones to say dua and all that. Um, and there was like this like uh, thusby thing, which is like a, a, it's like a, it's like a poem, which is the best way to describe it. It's like a 10 line, like English thing. It's in English. And you say it like 
um, as like a prayer, like as a like a grace. It's like grace, right? You say it before you eat. You say it uh, before you like uh, leave a place. You, like before kind of like you say it one time. Like the person who's sitting in the front says it, and everybody takes turns being in that position. They say it, um, and then they dismiss. Uh, you know, it's like it's a pretty frequently said thing, right? I don't know how to say it exactly, but it was like a it was like ten like sentences or something like that. I had heard people say it. I didn't know how. And now usually you're supposed to ask somebody if you don't know how, and it's your turn to do it. But I didn't, I just assumed I knew. I don't know how, I don't know how I thought I knew. But I said lines like one, two, and 10, and that's it. I left out the whole thing. And the other person who was supposed to say something else right after me just continued on as if I didn't fuck up that whole thing. Um, and everybody's like looking at me and it's like awkward. And I'm thinking, I'm like, hmm, that was a lot shorter than I remember. And then I see people laughing and I'm like, oh, I fucked that up, didn't I? I had trouble with the dua too, which the dua is like the main prayer. You know, like the, when they say Muslims pray five times a day, that's the prayer. That's what they do five times a day. It's, well, I don't know if everyone calls it dua, but man, I forgot so much of it. I fucked it up. Um, I had to read it out of a book and I still fucked it up because I would pause every time, like I would come across something I couldn't read the word of. And uh, I would like, you could hear the pages turn and I would take like a break in between the pages turn and like, Dude, the girls were laughing at me for that shit. And it's like, that kind of felt bad. That kind of stung a little bit. The dudes were laughing with me. I respect that. Like, hey, you're one of the boys. You get what I mean. You probably forgot to do that too. And I know a lot of them did because everybody was reading out of the books. But the girls were like judging me. Bro, you don't even know half the shit. And now, look at you now. They're in college. They're all atheist. They all have like hella uh, tattoos and piercings and all that. Like, they're like as, as anti-religion as they can be. And now if I talk to them, they'd be like, oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. You were ahead of your time. I shouldn't have uh, been so like serious about religion back then. But the problem is not that they're serious about religion. The problem is that they're just, they're, they just take stuff seriously. The problem is that now they're serious about being against religion. It's that now they're serious about like having all these like tattoos and piercings and being a rebel and going against what their parents told them and all that stuff. It's like, don't take any of it seriously. Don't take what your parents say seriously. And also don't take what your parents don't say seriously either. These girls were just way too serious about stuff. That kind of annoyed me. That kind of ticked me off, you know? Not a lot of things at that camp ticked me off, but that was one of them. But yeah, um, and the staff, like, they were staring angrily at me. I, I don't care about that. Like, that's going to happen. And they chewed me out once we left. Um, like, hey, you can't be doing all this fucking bullshit, like, intentionally pausing in between pages, taking, like, a breather. But, you know, it's whatever. What are they going to do about it, you know? Kind of wasn't so bad. Oh, dude. Confessions night. Wait, I gotta talk about this. So, going into Aluma, I knew nothing. Um, except for, number one, there's Oreos, and my brother told me the strategy, the optimal strategy is to trade Oreos for fan time. And number two, there's a thing called Confessions Night at the end of camp. It was like a day of a thing. And everyone knew about it. Like, we'd heard stories about it. And all these times where people would go to Aluma and they'd get incredibly close with their, like, uh, Aluma family or whatever, right? They would always, like, oh, go, like, oh, confession night, confession night. They'd always talk about these things. And that was one thing that really stuck out. That was, like, the thing that Aluma was known for, even more than the Oreos. It was, like, the way they described it was, like, you make good friends at Aluma, but what seals your bond as a family is confessions night. So the way it worked, the way it was described is, like, you all gather around at night in a circle, right? Maybe like a campfire in the middle or something like that, but it's um, all 100 of you and nobody says a word, okay? Everybody's quiet, except for a person who voluntarily decides to stand up and go into the center and confess something. And you don't have to do it. Um, nobody calls on you. Uh, there's no like order or anything. If you wanna do it, you do it. Um, you just get up and, and go and you say something. And like, the reason why they stop doing it is well, it's, it's kind of like, it's the exact reason why we needed it so much. It's the exact reason why they shouldn't have stopped doing it. Because, okay, well, most people had, like, very tame confessions, right? Oh, I feel like a failure. Uh, my grades are shit. I'm disappointing my parents. I have no goals or direction in life. I'm wasting my life. You know, all that shit. Everyone has, like, the same sort of regrets at this age. Um, nothing wrong with all that. Like, that's, that's actually pretty normal for Zoomers at this point. But sometimes people would say, like, stuff that can get them fired from their jobs or other people fired from their jobs or it could, like, hurt people, like, pretty badly. Like, people could want revenge and things like that. Um, uh, or, or they could... There have been instances where people have said, like, incriminating things about, like, themselves or their parents or other people, even people at the camp. There have been stories about people talking about, like, oh, uh, my uncle molested me, that sort of thing. Um... People have said things, like about their parents even, 
like about their own families, stuff that would like get child protective services involved and taking them away from their parents. In in my my brother's camp, people were talking about how like, oh my parents had an affair, and actually at his camp, uh, I believe there there was a person who was like, oh my parents had an affair, and the the person who my mom had an affair with is that person's dad, and it was another person at the camp. And ours our, our uh, confession that people were talking about, oh I was diagnosed with AIDS, um, all that sort of thing. Like there's a lot of it's 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 deep it's not um it's not for the faint of heart for sure like ours was not that like actually no ours was pretty bad our people didn't say like stuff about um other people in ours all that much but people were more like oh uh i did i i uh did a hit and run and i ran away and i got away with it and all that stuff so people were saying but it's like that's a that's actually a pretty common thing but then again cheating is also a pretty common thing but yeah, this a lot of a lot of crazy stuff happened um, at camp. My brother told told me a story about how oh there was this uh, there was this guy who uh, who came up and talked about how like his whole family screwed up. Uh, they all like committed like huge huge crimes, like stuff that you would get people for a RICO for, um, and they all have like court dates and on some like GTA type shit, you know, like on some actual like hitman murder. Like it was it was ridiculous. Obviously, there's no hitman hired, for, from what I remember, from what I recall, it was literally just um, a person tried to hire a hitman, but it was just, it was a, a honeypot, obviously. That's what all these sites are. Or they're either honeypots by the police or just uh, random kids trying to screw you out of Bitcoin. It's all it is. But yeah, these, these got deep. And like nobody, bro, we had built such a strong connection that people were not. It was really, really unlikely that people would be lying. They let it all out at Confessions Night. Like this is probably stuff that they would never tell. And this is stuff that they probably thought to themselves that they'd take to their grave. And that if Luma never happened, they probably would have taken to their grave. And in the moment, they're emotional, they're vulnerable, and they, they took it away. They got rid of Confessions Night. Which from one perspective, I can understand why they would feel motivated to do so. But from a much more valid perspective, it's ridiculous to get rid of something that is so impactful. It's impactful for a reason. It should be there. You can't have the good without the bad. You're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. They they did do like a similar, they kind of replaced it at our, our thing uh, with like two separate things. Number one, there was like a, a like a smaller group breaking boundaries type thing where there was like counselors that would like oversee it to make sure nothing crazy happened. Because like when the counselors are involved, it's like you have a bit of a filter on you. Um, and also there was like this event where it was like, we got in a giant circle. We thought it was going to be confessions night. Um, but instead we like, it was like a, 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 a bonding exercise basically where everyone passed a string around and connected the string to each other and like, see, look, everyone, we're all connected. And then people would like close their eyes and they'd ask questions like, okay, tap someone if, uh, they made you feel good at some point during camp and certain people would go around tapping other people on the shoulder. Um, if, if they did that and, and everybody would keep their eyes closed and then they would lift certain people up and they'd be like, oh, you go, you go next. And it was like a very quiet thing. Like it was, there was nothing, um, they're trying to, uh, throw out the bathwater. They're trying to get rid of the bad, but only keep the good by basically not asking any bad questions, like keeping it very controlled, but sorry, you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. That was no, that was nothing. That was nothing. And everybody knew that. It was so like everybody knew about confessions night as well. And people went into camp knowing about Confessions Night. Actually, we also did like a third thing because they knew you got rid of Confessions Night, you got to back it up. You got to have some, you better have a solid replacement for it. So we did this one thing where there was like a, a inner circle and then an outer circle and like the, they would be rotating uh, and you'd get like a minute to like talk to each person. Um, that's not enough. And even then it's not like a, there is no replacement for Confessions Night. You have to do it. You have to do it. It's just that like, I can see where they're coming from because of the damage that it's caused, like to the community. If their goal is to bring the community together, this is actually not like a, a viable long-term strategy. They, they'd rather, the Ismaili community, as, as screwed up as it sounds, would rather have people take the bad things to the grave rather than let, them, let it out because they care more about the money they earn from the collective rather than the mental health of the individual, which is what you're serving by Confessions Night. You're, you're, uh, in, you're strengthening their mental health, but they're saying, no, 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 screw the mental health of the individuals. We don't care about them. Um, we just want them to stay in the community. So we'd rather them take these, uh, deep, dark secrets to their grave, but okay. Maybe I'm attributing malice where there really isn't any, uh, but I don't think I am. 
I don't think I am. I, I think I'm right when I when I talk about their motivations. And everyone even knows that. I think everybody would agree with me. That is their motivation. They want to keep people in the community because there's only one mandatory thing in a smiley has to do. There's one. You don't have to go do a hajj. You don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to do any of this pray facing mukka or whatever. You don't have to pray, what's it called? Attend kane. You don't have to do any of this stuff. There's only one requirement, absolute requirement of the religion. You have to pay 12 and a half percent, 12.5 percent of your income to the uh, the, the the religion to Aga Khan, basically. So yeah, and I've asked I've asked so many people. I've asked my parents, I've asked uncles and aunts, and and even the scholar. That is the only requirement of being a Muslim. Of, of not being a, of Muslims have like there's like a zikr thing. And it's like 2.5 percent, and there's like di uh, different things for different sects and stuff like that. But ours was 12 and a half percent. I don't pay it, so I guess I'm not an Ismaili anymore. I've violated the one and only rule of, of being an Ismaili, which is not paying money, physical, cold, hard cash. That's what they're after. That's really what they're after. There's a reason why it's the only rule. But yeah, it was um. It was still pretty intimate, like when we made the bracelets and stuff, as stupid as I'm making it sound, it's because it's not a replacement for confession night. Um, but I did wear that bracelet for like another like, um, that we made out of the string. I wore that bracelet for like three, four weeks, a good amount of time, like a really, really solid amount of time. I didn't even take it off. I mean, I took it off like in the shower and stuff, but I knew I was wearing it and I put it back on after the shower. It was just a piece of yarn though, at the end of the day. I think I still have it. Um, I don't wear it anymore. I haven't worn it in forever. Uh, but I'll show it. I'll show it eventually if I if I can find it. But look, even after all this, even after this like super long night of of uh, what is supposed to be a replacement for confession night, we all got back to our dorms, and like we're we're complaining. We're like, dude, this is this is stupid. Where the hell is our like w one final hurrah? You know. So we're there. We're in the dorms, and me and like twenty other dudes, we're like, screw it. We're taking this in our own hands because we already took the camp in our own hands. So we went to the debrief room, like just the 20 of us, and we had our own confessions night. Um, and what was said on confessions night? I remember. I remember what was said. And I remember what I said too. And that is not my place to say. It was meaningful enough for me to remember that of everything. But I could never, I could never speak those words. It's not my place to... To, to speak the words that I heard that night to anybody else. But I'll remember it for the rest of my life. So yeah, that was Aluma. That's really all I gotta say about it. I had fun. I probably had more fun than anybody else I know that went to Aluma and um, nobody knew about it. All the shit that we did. We got back home and I was added to the group chat. Um, not the Atlanta group chat. Um, the Atlanta group chat forgot about me, but the 2017 Camp One group chat I was added to. And then at some point, uh, I think it was like the next year, actually. Uh, no, 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 it was like that year. It was like, that was the summer. We did it this in like June. Actually, we did this literally like around the time where I'm uh, streaming this right now, because right now is when Aluma Camp 1 is happening. Um, but this time in 2017. And um, I made some like 9-11 uh, joke in the in the uh, chat on 9-11. I said like, a happy 9-11 anniversary, everybody. And uh, people got mad at me for that. You have to remember, the whole reason why we went to Aluma is so that they can push propaganda on us, like, oh, jokes are bad, uh, orange man bad, Islam good, Muslims good, uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov good, Conor McGregor bad. Like, that, that's the kind of thing that they were, like, instilling deep, deep, deep within us, you know? I mean, I, okay, they didn't say the last part. They didn't say Conor McGregor and Khabib. They didn't, they weren't on that wave yet. But they weren't far off. And you know what? The next year, they probably did. So, um, people were getting uppity about it. Cause like they had they had fallen for the trap they'd taken the bait and uh they were messaging me they're like this is why we get bullied in school because people like you give muslims a bad name and it's like me i'm i'm making fun of the muslims that give us a bad name <laughs> you sure i'm the one you sure i'm the one that's giving you guys a bad name what about people actually doing 9-11 <laughs> so yeah um i'm not even muslim actually i don't i don't believe in half of these things I like, at least on a literal level, which is what they expect you to believe if you're a Muslim. And you know what? These people aren't Muslims either. They go out, they get tattoos, which is against... You're not allowed to do that as a Muslim. They smoke, you're not allowed to do that. They drink, you're not allowed to do that. They'll even eat pork, which, like, is a very easy thing to not do. It's a very easy thing to avoid. It's not nowhere near as addictive as vape and smoke and drink. It's nowhere near 
as enticing as that. You could just say, no, I'm good. I don't want to eat the pepperoni pizza. I'll just take the pepperonis off and eat the cheese. But they'll still do it anyways. None of these people are Muslim either. They're just fooling themselves, basically. They're just role-playing is all it is. This is delayed role-play. They didn't role-play enough when they were kids, so now they got to role-play when they're older. And now they need a lot more of it to feel satisfied. But I, uh, I roasted Muslims. I left the group chat after that. And they tried to kick me out, but I left anyways before they could. And I left with a bang. Brumts. That one was intended. I leave all my group chats, actually. I get kicked out or leave all my group chats, uh, especially with the smileys. It's, it's cool because I exit with Sal, which reminds me of another group chat I exited with Sal. I can't believe I forgot. There was this girl at uh, Aluma, and she was pretty high up on the list. I was shocked. Uh, to me, she's kind of... Uh, I thought she was attractive when we were younger, but as, as I grew up, I'm like, oh... She's kind of, she's kind of like a thought. She's kind of gross. She's kind of like a, a off limits. Like she's got an aura to her. Like if I, if I stand too close to her, I might catch a disease or something, you know? That's kind of what it was. It was, there was a lot of fakeness in the way that she looked and the way that she acted. But um, yeah, she was like, I think on the guy's list, she was like top five or something like that. You know, top three even maybe. I saw her at Luma and it had been a while before that since uh, I last saw her. We grew up in the same kind of, and I was, you know, I was me. I was a rebel. I was a pain in the ass to all my teachers. Uh, barely anybody liked me. My earliest memory of her, actually, is the last day of a class we had together. And she goes, I'm glad that uh, you're moving to this place. Uh, I hope I never see you again for the rest of my life. She literally said that to me. And that's my earliest memory of her. I don't remember her in the class. I remember the class, but I guess... Uh, I mean, she didn't leave much of an impression on me during that class, but I guess I left one on her so much that she would say that. But then again, it's not like that crazy that she said that because she's kind of like a toxic person in general. She's the kind of person who would like, who couldn't take criticism, but will dish it out just as easily. Like she, I'm not a criticism. She can't take insults at all, but she will like say like a uh, uh, deep cutting insults to the core of a person's being at them with like no empathy at all. That was crazy. A crazy thing to say. I hope I never see you again for the rest of my life. That's like a, that's such a cruel thing to say. I would never say that to someone. Well, it didn't, re didn't really work out for her the way that she wanted. So, see, going into camp, I knew she already didn't like me, right? I think that's obvious because of what she said. Um, and also, she really didn't like me because even though before that we had like never talked before, like for a while before that. Um, remember a story I told about Camp Mosaic about Anusha Charania? This is Alma Trania. This is her little sister. I had already pissed off Alma's older sister, and she was aware of that. And she even threatened me at one point. But like, that happens all the time. It's not that serious. Anyways, she had just gotten out of a relationship with one of my childhood friends, Ramez Koja. Ramez and I knew each other for a long time when we were little. To understand the kind of guy Ramez is, we were at this dude's sixth or seventh birthday party, right? Seventh birthday party. I was eight years old, he was seven, okay? I'm a grade older than him. And this dude is seven years old. He doesn't have an older brother or anything. He doesn't talk to the older kids. And he's showing us the names of all these porn sites. He's like, bro, I have them all here. He shows us like porn sites that don't even exist anymore. He shows us RedTube and uh, uh, Pornhub and all that stuff. He's seven years old. It's not even normie sites like that. He shows us a couple normie sites, but the majority of the sites are like stuff I can't even say the name of. At seven, he just learned how to talk. How are you saying these things just after you learn how to talk? And all of us would be watching it and then he would out of nowhere go like full eight mode. He would just go eight mode. He would be like, bro, I just want to smack that ass. Seven years old, horny motherfucker, bro. He showed us like the craziest like fetish shit. He showed us like a grandma getting fucked and all that. Like there was nothing vanilla about his personality even when he was seven. I've never seen someone that horny in my life. When I think about it, there's never been a person I've ever known that horny in my life. He has such little self-control. But we had some good laughs as kids. Um, but yeah, I stopped talking to his entire grade level uh, when they like stopped inviting me into their homes uh, for like birthday parties and stuff like that. I'm not exactly sure why, but they just stopped inviting me to places. It's whatever. Hold up. Wait. To put into perspective the kind of guy this was, this is the only remaining picture I have of him. Should I get the seatbelt system cut from my car? It's really annoying because I don't even wear a seatbelt anymore. 
and it's just a com constant high-pitched beeping. That is the last remnants of anything I have, uh, any picture or anything I have with Ramez. Wait a second. Alima was dating a guy younger than her, a year younger. Wait, they started dating when she was 12. Ramez was 11. Damn, that's crazy. I shouldn't really speak. I, I, okay, I should stop. I shouldn't speak on someone who I haven't spoken to in years. We might, we might like still be friends to this day, you know, um, if we met up again. Um, but I'll just say like literally what happened, not like anything about his character or anything, but on a literal level, he cheated on her. Okay. Actually, I will say one thing. Cheating shows a very lack of self-control. Oh, man, that was crazy because he cheated on her with like six other girls. And what's funny is that after he cheated on her with every girl, they still got back together after that. Which let me know like, oh, Alma is not that uh, high value of a girl, you know? She, she, she looks cool. She looks like cute, right? But she's not a very uh, like a, a high caliber, high tier girl, you know? She's not one that I would like, um, I don't know how you would describe it. She, I wouldn't be proud to, she wouldn't make a good wife. That's what it is. She'd make a good like girlfriend. She wouldn't make a good wife. And that's what I do it for. So, and, and what was crazy, it was crazy is during camp, one of the girls that he cheated on her with was this girl named Anam Ali. And I showed a picture of her earlier, uh, where she was like, um, Muslim was giving her a piggyback ride and stuff like that or in the pictures. That was Anam. And, um, she went to, uh, Woodward Academy with me, private school back in like pre-K. Uh, and she has the same last name as me, Ali. So, uh. In all of her classes that she didn't have with me, she was the first on roll call, except for when we had a class together, and I was first. Because I was first alphabetically in, in the whole grade level. Like, there was like, I would say like 48 or so kids or something like that, and like the entire graduating class. Woodward Academy, for those of you guys who don't know, it's like a, it's actually a pretty well, pretty familiar school, um, like nationwide. It's a pretty acclaimed school. Um, I even saw like, in my grade level, I had no idea, in my it, uh, class of 2018, uh, big boy from, uh, what's it called? Uh, Outcast. His son was in my grade. He was like in my classes and stuff. I had no idea. Um, a lot of, actually a lot of celebrity alumni went to, went to Woodward considering how small the school was, but it was stupid expensive. And that girl who I mentioned earlier, uh, like their cousin, she also went to Woodward and all that. She hated me too. I think there's like a general theme here with like Ismaili, Ismaili girls just hating me. I was talking to Alma one of the days in Aluma and I recall this story about Ramez and I see Anam on the other side of the room and I go, wait a minute, that's Anam. I'm not even talking to Alma, but I'm there and I'm like, that's Anam. Wasn't she? And then she cuts me off. Alma cuts me off. She goes like, yo, yo, stop, 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 stop. Don't say anything. Don't say anything to Anam either. Don't say anything to anybody else. And I was like, Okay, I didn't say anything. Like actually, I mean, I may have mentioned it in passing, but that's it. Um, neither of them liked me. So it's like, what are they gonna, they're not gonna take what I say seriously, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't. If they're smart, they shouldn't. Like Anum was like fine with me, but Alma really didn't like me. But um, what was I, what was I talking about? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exiting a group chat with style. This, uh, this relates, okay? The next year, actually, we had REC together. I have pictures of it. So this was the class. This is a picture. What a shit picture, dude. Dude, look at the noise in this picture. Holy hell, dude. Use somebody else's phone. But I mean, at least, I don't know what's going on here. This is as dark as it gets, right? Lower the contrast phone. Like, why are you introducing this much noise into a scene this bright? Whatever, man. I don't get it. I don't know what phone this was taken with, but... Oh, Snapchat. Okay, never mind. Snapchat, yeah, you're gonna introduce filters and noise into everything. So this is, um, Arish, Arish, whatever, and that's Arsh. Don't get them confused. They're two different people. This dude I used to talk to a lot when I was little, but he just stopped talking to me one day, and I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. This is Arsh. We had crazy laughs together, bro. This dude and I have, like, a very, very similar sense of humor, and I was able to make this dude laugh consistently, easily effortlessly even. That's me right there. Dude, I gotta tell stories about Ursh, about like the chalk, the pool table and all that stuff, about like when we were in the house, all like playing truth or dare and all that. That was, that was fun. And here's Raheem, of course, t-shirt and jeans, well shirt and jeans. Nice, I respect that. I should have done that. This is so stupid. They made me wear this, but I should have done this. We should have been the only two. This is, this is what I mean. Like, like we're squad, but sometimes I don't like, I gotta go above and beyond. I gotta stop doing whatever they tell me and just like go and wearing a t-shirt and jeans. I should have worn like my tuner coat shirt or something like that. Um, that's Shez. I believe that his name is Shez. Um, these are the teachers, uh, Amir Ali and some, I don't know. This dude right here, he, uh, uh, damn, I don't remember his name. This is Arisha Captain. I talked about her in the school stream. 
We had RAC quite a few times. It's really cool that her last name was Captain. That's like the coolest last name ever. Um, that's even better than L Emily Best's last name. This is Cheyenne. I don't remember her name, but I remember her. This is Sarosh. She went to SCAD, uh, Savannah campus, and her older brother. Still talk with them occasionally, like once every, like, I don't know, six months or so. He shows up, pulls up to the place. This is Sanisha, who I mentioned earlier, and this is Alima. So yeah. This was the class. Why does she look so small in this picture? I got, okay, no, perspective, but like, damn, that's some perspective shift, huh? It's like weird, she looks so much more than them, but she like is, like these two are kind of chunky, you know? Maybe I shouldn't, oh, okay, so, okay. This dude right here is this dude. I knew because I wanted to buy Supreme drops from him so I could resell it. Um, so I labeled him just buy Supreme. I should have saved his name. Uh, oh, this was also, I ditched the REC class, go hang out with them. Um, Sahil, right here, we go to Subway. This is also a part of the REC class, I believe. This is like, like a thing that uh, the dude was like covering up the camera with his finger, the cameraman. I don't know how he didn't see that. Is he not looking through the viewfinder? But yeah, that was the, cl actually we didn't even have REC together. I went to a different continent. I just changed my class to the uh, Duluth one because uh, Zoeb went there. I was like, screw it. I'm gonna go hang out with Zoeb and Raheem. Raheem went there too. Um, but Raheem, Raheem like didn't ever like, he never showed up to class like that. It was only after I showed up there, it's like, hey, let's all hang out, you know? So we'd all leave. Raheem, I, I made a bad turn and he crashed his car into mine, but that was totally my fault. That happened during REC when we were ditching. It was like, okay, class was from like, um, I don't know when it started. I think it was like six to nine, but I don't know when it started because we showed up every day at uh, 8.45. I know it ended at nine because that's when we'd show up just to like get attendance, you know? And I would just show up. I, I, it's not like I was getting attendance. I would just show up just because I was hanging out with Zoeb. And now eventually I just kind of integrated myself into this class because even though I was hardly a part of it, I was just as much of a part of the class as Zoeb was and Raheem was. So um, they added me to the group chat. The group me group chat. This is all group me. Smiley's like to use group me a lot. And one day in this group chat, like I, I see the messages occasionally. I never actually post anything. And um, I post a meme and me and Zoeb and Raheem just stay posting memes in it. But I think like the last straw, this was like all over the course of like a week or two where I'd start posting memes. Um, and then the one of the memes that I put in there was like a person in a jail cell and the dude at the outside is like looking in at him. And the captain is like, oh, when Amir Ali, who's the, who's the uh, teacher? He's like, oh, when Amir Ali catches your friend and you see him stuck in REC or something like that. REC is, um, REC's Religion Education Center. It's just a meme at the end of the day. Cause sometimes the teacher, Amir Ali, would like see us walking by, cause we'd ditch and we'd be outside and stuff like that. And sometimes he'd see us walking by and he'd open the door and be like, hey, come inside class. I see you're here now. Um, oh, wait, no, 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 no. I have it, I have it, I have it, I have it. So this is all around the same time. So I, this is the meme I post, okay? Uh, when you escape, I should have cut this white bar out. When you escape Amir Ali's lectures, but your homie's still trapped in REC. <laughs> cause like, this is, Look, 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 right here. This is the kind of thing that would happen. So I'd be outside, that's Zoeb. That's Zoeb in there, and I'd be recording him. And I'd post stuff like this. Like, well, you guys stuck in REC. You see the way they act, bro? Look at the way he's moving. Like, they're all like, they're super animated. Look at, look at the way he acts. And that's Raheem right there. And the dude sees me. And dude's like, hey, hey, what's up? It's you, come on in. So that would happen um pretty frequently. In fact, Zoe posted this meme in our group chat. I don't think he posted it in their group chat because like I had already got kicked out for that. But he posted this meme in our group chat. It's like when you escape REC, but your man's still in there. <laughs> man, what a what an actual, like that's an incredible meme. It's so spot on. It's not like a ironic, it's not like nowadays you see the memes just like covered in like 70,000 layers of irony. It's just like, hey, this is what's going on, bro. I just thought I'd make a joke out of it. So I post that first meme, the dude in prison. Um, I put that in the group me group chat and Alama responds and she says something like if I remember correctly She's like, oh, how dare you disrespect REC? Uh, and our teacher who takes uh, so much time out of his day to come teach us you aren't even a part of this class You know and like and and she just went off. She was like super she was enraged She was enraged and it's like you're gonna be angry. You're gonna take stuff seriously around me You're gonna say that to me Bad move. I mean, at least say something a little hurtful if you're gonna take stuff seriously. Because I follow a very, very clear principle. There's almost nothing in life you should ever take seriously. I think that's like, the, that's the healthiest way to live life. There's a few things you should take seriously. There's a few, don't get me wrong, but it's very, very few. And it's like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna allow yourself to have a reaction, you're gonna allow my trolling to work. 
right? My trolling to elicit a reaction out of you. How are you too stupid to realize how much of a mistake that is on your part? Unless you want me to do it more. Because like I said, if you're if you're gonna go stepping on toes, you might as well stomp on their feet and go all out with it, right? So if she's operating in the realm of stepping on my toes, at least be a little more hurtful. At least message me directly and say something that you would get kicked out of the group chat for saying, right? And she had my contact. She could have messaged me directly. It's on group me. You can message anyone in the group chat. So I see this message. Actually, uh, um, they tell me, they tell me like, Zobi's like, hey, look at what Alma said in the group chat. And we're looking at that. We're laughing at that shit. Uh, what, you know what it is? You know what it is? <laughs> <laughs> hey, y'all, come look at this. <laughs> so that's, that's basically what happened when we saw Alma's response in the group chat. She was pissed, dude. She was, she was steaming, bro. Steaming. Malden, steaming. All the words for it. I don't, I don't know what, what other words for it. I, I gotta watch more Twitch so that I find more, more uh, related words. Coping. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, she was losing her mind. And we're outside, and we're ditching class when we see this. She, I don't know why she sent this like during class. And so I'm, um, I'm driving around in my car. I have the video here. I've I have the video. Um, doing circles in this parking lot. We found a really cool parking lot. It's this really nice place where you could do donuts in like a really big area. I should go back there. I should throw a car meet there. Like that's a really, it's a beautiful area to throw a car meet. Good parking. Um, lots of space to do donuts, and it's like very, uh, very well contained. Um, with like a very clear line, very clear circle as to where you should be doing the donuts. So um, Faison or, or uh, Raheem or some somebody is like uh, behind me in this video. Uh, maybe it was Nair, I don't know. But um, in, I'm sitting on the top on the sunroof, okay? And we're doing this. This is something I do on a regular basis. Not so much anymore, but when I was like, you know, 15, 16, 17, the thing I would do is I would get used to driving um, using my knees on the steering wheel and I would be in cruise control or I'd put my feet on the steering wheel if I was wearing like stickier shoes, which I didn't usually have because I would wear out my shoes quite a bit. I was sitting on the roof of my car and I believe I was using my knees to control it because my shoes were not good. And Zoib or someone like tells me to check the group chat and I just record this video. Just, so there's a car behind me. This is in front of me. This is the carman. Alma, more like all of that makeup on your face. Boy, you look like a Muppet. Zoib! You can hear him in the back yelling Zoib too. I don't know. I don't remember who that was. I think that might have been Nair. But yeah, that's crazy. Like that's so long ago. That feels so long ago. But that's what happens though. When you um when you got hella YouTube clout and uh, it gets to your head, even though it really means nothing, and uh, you make more money when you're 17 in like a few months than the teachers do in a year. So yeah. Anyways, I send that video in the group chat naturally, right? And then I leave and I refuse to elaborate. I send the video in the group chat and I refuse to elaborate further. All they need is, is, is the video that I sent. No extra information needed. But yeah, I look, I'll never simp for a hoe, okay? Not back then, not now, and never in the future. Actually, there there was one time. But that's a story for another day. I, I'm, I might tell that story next. I, was, I said I was going to talk about the cruise, right? So I will tell that story next. So I leave the group chat and uh, I don't bother to stick around to see her reaction. And that right there my friends, that is how you leave a group chat. So apparently after that, I thought this was over. I thought this whole like shenanigans was done, right? This tomfoolery had ended. Apparently this spread around. Word got around that I did that. And people were messaging me, like people from Aluma were messaging me because like they knew, they knew Alima from Aluma. And they were telling me like, oh, you should apologize for this and I'll, like, First of all, to be clear, to the people who went to Illuma with me, if you're watching this, I know I kept this a misconception this whole time, but I'll clear it up right now. First of all, <clears throat> I don't even think the joke was original. I think I stole that dish from Faison because I didn't even know she wore makeup. I don't even know what makeup looks like. Oh, wait, when visiting Texas a year later, like two girls uh, from Illuma came up to me and they're like angry with me that I said that. Keep in mind, this is an isolated thing. This is sent in the REC group chat with like 12 people in it. Not the Aluma group chat with like 120 people. Bro, I, I don't know why she decided to, to fucking tell everyone in existence that I roasted her. There's no other, other possibility. Like, I never told anyone. Well, I mean, now I did with this, but... Oh, wait. No, no, no. There's, um... There's a... I got a call. I got a call. No, no, no. Okay, so one day... This was quite a while later. This was like months later. Months down the line. I'm with Mosin, right? And he's in my basement. We're playing table tennis. We're eating... 
that uh, that Tuscany pasta from from Pizza Hut. Shit's amazing. Um, and we're just talking about life, you know. And Molson gets a call from that dude earlier. I mentioned Molson. I mentioned Eunice, right? Eunice went to uh, Aluma with us as well. A lot happened at Aluma. That's like I need reminders for this sort of thing because I know what happened. It's just hard to recall. It's like a it's like a, a fill in the blank test. I need a multiple choice test, you know. If you can jog my memory a bit, I'll remember what happened. So we're chilling. Eunice uh, calls Mosin, and we all start talking. He puts it on speaker. We all start talking, and uh, this comes up, and he's like, "Afraz, why'd you do this?" And I ask him, "I'm like, okay, how does everyone know about this? Like, how do people who I've never even met in my life start like messaging me about this?" And Eunice is like, "Bro, everyone knows. Alama told everyone." Um, or he said Ali told everyone. She didn't call herself Alama. She called herself Ali because Alama sounds too close to Aluma. That's what, that was your excuse, but that's not true. It's because brown girls want to act like white girls and brown guys want to act like black guys. But that's none of my business. And you know I'm right. You know I'm right. You all know it. You've all seen it. Every brown guy gets the same haircut. Same, like, line up in the front. Like, the way that Aleem looked in that picture. Same every single time, right? They're always hiding their widow peak, um, um, fade on the side, on both sides usually, uh, same clothes, um, buying the same like old BMWs and like shitty G35s with a straight pipe and like blasting like shit mainstream rap, constantly smelling like weed. You've all seen it. You all know what I'm talking about. That's um, the secret to how brown people operate. If you want to know how, like, how to tell if a brown person's a normie, if they're a, a brown girl, they'll act white. They'll act like a white girl. They want to be a white girl. And white girls in America want to be black. Um, they want to act like, they want to be a part of the culture. They want to be a part of hip hop. They want to do all that stuff. So they usually act black as well. And they won't act like themselves. You know, they won't act, they won't speak with any, like, I think I speak with a little bit of, um, I sometimes speak a little bit too fast, but that was not intentional. I swear to God, it was not intentional. But I try to speak with like a very clear voice, right? I don't have an Atlanta accent. Like the way a lot of these like, a lot of these like hood dudes, they'll speak in like a very difficult to understand accent. I understand it, but I make a point of speaking like the way they would call like, they, they'd be like, oh, you talk like a white person. I make a point of that because I want everyone to understand me. So I don't, I, I, I try my best to make sure like I am talking the way that I want to talk, right? But if you want to know if they're normies, the, the brown girls will try to act like white girls and the brown guys will try to act like black guys. And that's like, that. that's the, I just cracked the code. But um, what I was saying, okay, yeah, yeah. Eunice, he literally says, he confirms it. He confirms to me, I knew it was Alia that was, or, or not Alia, I knew it was Alma. I know a different Alia. I knew it was, it was Alma that was like out here shouting it from the rooftops that I'm the one who did this. But now I have a little like confirm, actually, I don't know if that, uh, now that I don't know if I could take what uh, Eunice says at face value, because this dude, like, let me tell you about this dude, actually. Okay, so if you watch me, you know, like, when I was a teenager, I spent most of my time just um, listening to girls tell me stories. Like, that oddly specific phrase, that's what I spent the majority of my time doing, because I like just listening to stories, and they open up. Um, I listen to anyone, actually, who's willing to open up about their stories and emotions. Guys didn't open up about their emotions. Girls did easily. Um, in fact, they were like happy to do so. I didn't, it was effortless. So over the years, I got really good at just like uh, listening. And ultimately that's what I wanted. I'm addicted to story, I still am. And movies just don't cut it for me anymore. TV just doesn't cut it for me anymore. I need something a bit stronger. I need a bit more potent of this drug. Um, anime still does it for me, but I've, uh, I've been getting jaded to anime kind of ever since, ever since college actually where we had to start analyzing film. But I guess that's the downside of going to art college. That I, If you truly enjoy art, I would recommend never going to art college, if you truly enjoy art. But um, yeah, I did the same sort of thing at Aluma. I would just list, I would just try to uh, extract as many stories, milk as many stories as I can out of these people. I tried to do that to a bunch of girls. Honestly, Aluma, I wasn't all that successful with. I was much more successful back at home where uh, I can establish a bit of a rapport, right? But I had a reputation because they knew, like people over there knew, oh wait, that's the guy that got blacklisted from Mosaic and that sort of thing, you know? So I, I, I had a bit of a reputation. I still I still got stories of a bunch of girls and one of these girls, her name was Faiza and she, wait, I have, I, I, their picture was up there. They were both up there. This was their, the uh, Jorania cousin, that's Anum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is Eunice. This is Faiza. This is Faiza. She's extremely, extremely short. 
Damn, I guess there's no pictures of her height. You look at like everybody else in this picture. Remember, I showed the video earlier of how short Mosin was. Dude, look at that. But yeah, that's them and that's Asmir, I believe. Wait, no, 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 that was, and I don't know. It's so hard to tell. People kind of blend together in my memory after a certain point. Faiza was one of these girls that I was like, hey, I can get a story out of her maybe. So I should give it a shot, right? First of all, let me get this straight. She looked like a middle schooler in camp, okay? Like I said earlier, I was not interested in hooking up with these girls. I'm not into Desi girls, dude. I don't like them. It's very rare that I'll find a Desi girl attractive. Uh, there's a couple from my childhood, but that's it. And that's because it's childhood and, and it's rose colored, rose tinted glasses, all right? So I was not interested in, in hooking up with these girls. See, at this point, like Ming Dynasty pussy got these dudes acting unwise, all right? I'm smarter than that. I've, I've got a bit more self-control self than these other guys. I can't blame them, right? I was the same. In fact, I was actually, it's not that I was the same earlier. I was the same even during camp. I was just addicted to something else. They were on that dopamine wave. I was on my oxytocin wave, all right? All I wanted was to hear some stories. Actually, I was on my oxytocin and adrenaline wave and like norepinephrine and all that. But I don't wanna get into, look, I don't, I'm not trying to sound like a fucking nerd, okay? So, um, I start talking to Faiza, like randomly, like in passing, right? And um, I notice she is one of the ones who I have a bit of like a, a, a not like chemistry with, right? But it's easy to uh, talk to her. Like I can flame her. Uh, she'll flame me back with no hesitation, right? There's very little hesitation in our speaking. Like I don't need to think about what I'm saying, and it's she doesn't need to think about what she's saying with me. So it's like it's uh, we're 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 able to communicate at a very high bit rate with very high accuracy, relatively speaking, instantly. There was no uh, uh, effort beforehand that we needed to put in. And now, during camp at least, Eunice was dating Faiza. It's so crazy, dude. She looks like some like Disney channel, like Mickey Mouse or something like, I don't know how you, whatever, man, to each their own. But yeah, Eunice was dating Faiza. And this is about Eunice, by the way, it's not about Faiza. So after talking to her and passing like two or three times, it was like a, over the course of a day, right? And I'm like, hey, fuck basketball. Go grab a drink. Let's go sit on side and talk. And by drink, I mean like water. We're at a Luma, dude. So we leave the basketball court. Or I think she was already off, the but I leave the basketball court. And Eunice is still there. He's on the basketball court. And he's watching like a fucking hawk, dude. And again, I have no ill intention, okay? Well, the, uh, you, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Maybe... Uh, uh, using people for as many stories as I can possibly get to satisfy my own addiction, maybe that's ill intention. I don't know. But I don't have the ill intention that people might think I have in this situation. So we sit down and I go like, I, a life story, run it. And she starts talking. And Eunice is far away. He's like on, way on the other side of the, of the building in the basketball court, right? He's playing. And I pay attention to what she's saying for like two seconds. Bro, fucking, not even a sentence into what Faiza is saying, not even a sentence into her telling her story. I look at my right and I see Eunice standing next to us. We're sitting down, he's like standing above us, trying to look all intimidating. This dude fucking teleported. He's like, hey, hey, hold up. And then he pulls her to the side. And they talk for like, I, I don't remember, like 30 seconds, a minute 30, something like that. And then she comes back, uh, comes to me again. And uh, Eunice is still standing there like far further away. And I stand up, cause I know what just happened, all right? This isn't the first time this happened. Um, this happened all the time throughout uh, middle school and high school. But I just, I don't, I never expected somebody as cool as Eunice to be such a pussy to do it. Cause she comes up to me and she goes like, uh, we can't really talk about this anymore. And I go like, I know, don't even worry about it. Cause it's like, I'd seen this before. I think this has happened plenty of times, but it's like, dude, Eunice, come on. You're, you're, <laughs> this dude, this dude was scared of me taking his girl. Not even taking, this, this dude was scared of me threatening their relationship. like. I'm a, a guy who sits inside all day. I'm inside. I have blackout curtains right now because I don't want to see the sunlight. I'm on Discord all day playing fucking Roblox and Brawlhalla. Um, I play no sports. I have shit hygiene. I have yellow teeth. I live in a different city than them. At the time, I weighed 84 pounds. I probably weighed less than this like four foot tall girl. And I had never, and still to this day, have never had a girlfriend in my life. Eunice was scared that that guy, the guy who has all of these like ridiculously stupid characteristics was gonna be a threat to their relationship. Well, that's flattering. 
makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside when I think about it. You think that I'm that competent? You must think very highly of me. I mean, like, okay, he didn't have the right idea, but his instinct wasn't wrong. Like, I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. If I fall for you, there's going to be trouble. Because I'm in a position now where, in my life, where I decide who I end up with. Not like the girl choosing me as one of her options, right? I'm the one who's choosing now. So it wasn't like I was incompetent, like how I'm making it out to be, right? I'm better about my hygiene. I weigh quite a bit more now. Going to the gym. I don't play video games like that anymore. I like I got shit going on, right? And uh, most of all, I had experience talking to girls. Like hella experience. Like I knew what I was doing, okay? There was no way I was screwing that up. Eunice will embarrass himself a thousand times in front of a girl before I embarrass myself once because of how much experience I have. Way more than him, 100%. And he had the wrong idea, but his instinct to keep his girl away from me, that was a smart move on his part. Not in the context of Aluma. I'm not such a horny bastard that I'll like try to like fuck a girl who I met like literally that day. But uh, yeah, if I decided to, mm, it probably would have happened. Not with Faiza. I mean, they were dating. I wouldn't, first of all, I would never do that. Second of all, on, on, on some real shit, trying to hook up with a girl who is in a relationship is actually a serious challenge. You have to be, you have to be on some shit to, to even attempt that sort of thing. Look, I wasn't that experienced with talking to girls in, in that sort of context. I was more experienced with just listening to girls, but ultimately that's what they want. They just want to be listened to. A lot of shit happened at Illuma. I'm not even close telling the full story, dude. There was so, dude, the rap, at the end of the talent show, the, there was that song we made where we did like a beat switch where we uh, uh, we went from like um, Redbone where we switched it up to like I Love Kanye, which we weren't allowed to do, but we did it anyways. Oh shit, okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. The best moment, dude. The best moment. Of, see, all these moments were cool, right? I said some like cool shit, but the best moment in Aluma, by far, by far. It's, it's, it's like the small things that matter, right? And this moment right here was just like pure magic. And like, people who went to Aluma with me may think differently. They may disagree with what the best moment is, but to me, it's like this this one little thing, this one little insignificant thing that most people probably forgot. And I'll explain why as well. So the guys' dorms, like I said, were a mile away from the girls' dorms, and, and the girls' dorms are right next to where everything else is. Like everything is in one spot, and the guys' dorms are just super far away from it. Usually if there was some sort of activity, the girls would show up first, right? Sometimes we'd show up first, but usually we'd show up second. And if it was something like Jamathkana, then we would just have to leave like 15 minutes earlier to get there at the same time. So we had less sleep. Um, we had less time to shower. We had less time, less time to like do stuff generally, right? Because we had to keep going back and forth to our dorms. But also when it came time to do stuff that involved like traditions or something, for example, like with eating, like everyone is supposed to get food at the same time because um, we all say some like a... Uh, like, I forgot what it's called, but it's like, it's like grace, but for like, a smileys, like for the community, for the kids. rub a dub dub thanks for the grub. Uh, Jana mana lama, thanks for the kana, something like that, you know? And kana means food. Um, I know kana means, it's, there's a bunch of different languages combined in one. Jamaat kana means like prayer house. Um, but in, <laughs> it's confusing, but it all makes sense. And kana means food in that, in, in that instance. So thanks for the kana means like, yeah. So I forgot exactly how it goes. I need a refresher. That's like for, only the kids like do this. Like this is how the kids say grace, basically. It's like a nice little chant everybody says at the same time. This is tradition, right? So we have to get there before the girls can just start eating. They have to wait for us. So they're just standing there one day. They're just ready, you know, ready to go get their food as usual. Except this time, for some reason, and I still fucking have no idea how this happened. We were probably like, we were talking about some like Indian movies and stuff, right? Just like bop and random soundtracks it's, i don't know something like that i don't know exactly how this transpired so there's like this like large room that connects all the dining halls uh like there's like the downstairs one there's the left one there's the right one um let me get rid of this picture let me see what the deal is with eunice damn he looks exactly the same bro this smile looks so fake the smile looks copied and pasted this looks like a deep fake this dude's smile is huge look at how like tall it is dude this is what i'm saying they all look the same they all look the same. Same haircut, same same fashion set, same clothes, like Gucci and all this stuff. Same, they all try to like ice themselves out. They all, they're the same. They're normies, bro. This is what I've been saying. This is what I've been saying. I've cracked the code. And there's a bit of a new meta now, but yeah, it's still, it's it's evolving. But yeah, that's, that's, that's how it is. 
Oh, that's Satam. He used to live in Atlanta. We used to be really, really good friends when we were seven years old. Then he moved to Alabama and uh, became a fucking normie loser. So yeah, uh, um, the girls are chilling. They're waiting for us to come through. They're in like the hub area. And there's like, there's only really only one entrance to this whole place. Um, and it's around the corner. So like, we know that they're going to be there. We can see through the windows that they're there. And they're waiting in the hall and, and we're all coming in. And once we get in there, then we can like go to like the food line stuff, right? And then somehow, like before we turn the corner, right? Just unanimously, we didn't plan this out. This is what, this is the crazy thing about it. We didn't plan this out. This just happened. And I was thinking in my head like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Somehow our conversation led to everybody else thinking the same thing as me, which is um, we all decide to start singing Cubby Cushy Cubby Gum, which I'm not gonna play. Um, most of you don't know what that is, but that's actually like a classic, classic Bollywood song. The person with the most points will win. Yeah, let's get into this one. When you rolled off your so they're trying to they're trying to get this girl right. Kind of rude. I don't know. What? I don't know. What's I, don't know. What's I, don't know. I don't know. No, I love the way they talk. So this is a chunk. Bro, chunks is the coolest one there. Like KSI, he's cool and all. That's because of what he has. But Chunks is like genuinely the funniest person there. Nyla. Very nice. Nyla, look at that name, Chugs. bro. Yeah. White chugs. I'm gonna just tell you a fake story then. Alright, go on. So there's one night, a night. Yeah. That's a dead story. Damn, just getting on to me like that. Hi. Oh, so what, so what so that's why I like her. That's what, yeah. No, oh, chunks, don't get comfy with my one, please, brother. You should know just of how I was moving, that's me. Yeah, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a Muslim, so the drinking stuff, we don't do that. Could be water. Huh? Could be water, could be soda, could be slushies. I like you're smart. You think outside the box. Yeah. I'm just in the box. Milkshake. No, nah, he's nervous. He's nervous. He's not even saying anything that makes sense. He's he's. This is how you know. A little a little word of advice to the girls out there. Okay, all all two of you watching, that will ever watch this. If a guy is, is good at flirting with you, he doesn't really like you. He's not really. He has to be nervous around you. It doesn't matter how good they are at flirt. They could be the god tier most excellent flirty like the 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 legendary uh flirt master right but if he actually truly likes you he's gonna be terrible at flirting he's just gonna be talking like in word association mode just be saying shit that's what's gonna happen i like her I like. and you know there's scientific backing behind that. there's actual scientific literature backing up the fact that like if a guy likes a girl He'll just like go like he'll just go brain dead when trying to talk to her. Where are you from, man? You look Look. different. Indian. Neighbors. Indian. It's just Indian. I love some it. other things, but Indian. Okay, cool, cool. So do you like the Bollywood? Definitely a lot of other things. Good. Yeah. Man said like Bollywood. What's your favorite film? Gabi Gushi, Gabi Gum. Huh? You like that? Yeah, yeah Gabi Gushi, Gabi Gum. That's uh, it's a, it's a, it's like a crazy well-known classic. He probably doesn't even know any Bollywood. Like he probably just said that because it's like such a like legendary. Like everybody knows what that is. It's the the beginning. The beginning part is sung by a girl. It's like ah 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 like that. I can't sing, but like you know what I mean. That's like how it goes. That's like how the intro goes, and then it gets into the song, right? Um, and then it's hype as fuck. But the melody of like the tune of her voice in the beginning is like. That's like the trailer for the rest of the song because that melody is constantly used. The like dun 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 dun. That melody is like all over the place. It's like the theme of the. It's like the underlying uh uh theme of the um underlying theme. What the fuck am I saying? Am I a fucking like review YouTuber or something? Uh, but yeah, that's like uh that constantly repeats itself throughout the entire song in like different ways with different instruments. Um different uh, uh vocals and all that that's the song bro there's a lot of there's a lot of iconic bollywood songs this is like top five this is like top five most iconic bollywood songs of all time um it's a movie too it's a movie and it, it's just it, the song is from the movie and they're both super iconic w kushi w i watched it when i was a kid a bunch of times probably dude this shit's been sampled hella actually i remember uh back in the soundcloud days Producers like like uh, this dude, uh, Codeine Boy, the beat dealer, and I believe it was Codeine Boy, the beat dealer, like 7700 was the name of the beat or something, so, somewhere along those lines, right? Um, 1770, something, I don't know, something like that. And in that song, he actually sampled it. He's like, Cubby Cushy, 
Yeah. And then the, it goes crazy. So it's like, it's a really popular thing. A lot of people know it. And we all, like every all, all of us, no matter how like whitewashed we are, we all definitely know it. That's like a part of being a smiley. Like, you know this. This is part of being Indian. That's part of being Daisy in general. Like, you know this song. And we were, remember the memes, like 2018, 2019 memes where uh, it was like all like boys locker room type stuff where like everybody would simultaneously sing the Halo theme while T posing? That was 2018, right? So we did that shit with the exact same energy. We'd walk in there like a cult, basically. We were so coordinated in the way, like, in the way that we caught these girls completely off guard. Because when you do things like this, it isn't the action itself that uh, is interesting. It's the reaction that lets you learn a lot about a kind of person, right? Um, when people react to stuff, that's why everyone loves reaction so much. Everything people do is a reaction to something. Gaming content is a reaction to the game. It's a reaction to watching a personality you know play the game and things like that, you know? All content is reactions. And so when when interesting things happen, when things unexpected happen, you catch people off guard. Watching how they react is is really, really insightful into the into the nature of their character. Filmmaking 101. But I, man, I can't even describe how amazing that was. How, like, the energy was in the room. And see, like, to, to everyone else, that's all there is, right? That's all there is to this story. We went in, we, we sang the beginning of Cubby Cushy, and uh, end of story, right? But, like, you have to, like, really think about what that entails. Like, what, uh, what, what that implies, rather. Entails? I think entails is the right word. Think about it. First of all, in that moment, we were all of one mind, of one spirit. We all understand each other. Like, that's what that is. It's understanding. It's being one of the boys. That's what that means. That was, like, our way of, like, uh, letting each other know, like, hey, we are one of the boys. Because the girls, they didn't know what to do. And some of them um, wanted to save face and join in. And some of them, like, looked, like, disgusted. Some of them, like, they were all trying to have, like, looking around. They were, they were looking at the other girls. They were looking at the guys. They were trying to have the most appropriate reaction. They were trying to save face, basically, right? Um, and some of them wanted to start their own thing to like counter us, right? Uh, it's like, it's competitive, it's complicated. There's a lot of social dynamics happening where 50 guys walk in a room all doing the same chant and 50 girls are just left out. Even though there's just as many of them, they're left out. And it's like, to, in my mind, it's like, why not just simplify it, right? Simplify it down and start singing along. That's what I would have done, but none of them did that. And some of the guys actually didn't sing along either. It wasn't all 50 of us. They, like, some of these guys were just as confused as the girls. And even though they were male, like, by, by, uh, uh, I don't know, gender, sex, whatever the hell you want to call it, right? Even though they were male, they had, uh, XY chromosomes, they weren't one of the boys. They weren't one of us, you know? Part of the shit, part of the crew. They just, they weren't that. But the boys... Wait, that's my third Pirates reference in this. But, okay, all the boys we understood, all right? The boys. The bros. And it's not even that we understood. Understanding is, diff is a different thing from having a connection. It's more than that. There's also an implication going in that we knew. Because, like, we wouldn't have done that if it wouldn't have elicited a reaction, right? You don't do things for no reason. We knew that the girls were in there who were waiting for us, that it would be funny to get the reaction. It would catch them off guard. But it's like... If you know that, how do you know that? How do you know it'll catch them off guard? And think about what that means. If you know that other people are not 100% on board with you, that means you're acknowledging that not only are you guys the bros, not only are you guys connected, you're one of mind, one of heart, one of soul, but you're also acknowledging that other people aren't. You're, you're cherishing, you're, you're uh, uh, showing others around you that you understand the value of this connection. Like, simply by... Thinking to yourself, oh, we're going to catch these girls off guard. That in itself implies that you wouldn't be caught off guard by this sort of thing. That this is you. That, that, that you're one of, one of us, you know? And even knowing how they're going to act. Even predicting, not only are they going to get caught off guard, they're going to feel concerned. Like they're going to want to save face. They're going to want to look good in front of others. They're going to be insecure, right? They're going to feel left out. It couldn't, this kind of thing could not have happened. Unless all of us understood that. But that's not even the most profound part. The most, that's the most profound part on like, a, uh, on like a storytelling level, right? But the most profound part to me was that we all had to know the song. Like, think about that for a second. How did we all know the song? You want to know how I knew? 
see uh when i was a kid um i had really i have really good memories of this and i'll talk about this on a different day but my family used to go to this um indie movie theater and it was like 20 minutes away from where we lived at the time which was a apartment complex we've been to several movie theaters uh like indian theaters there's like one where you go in the back door of like an amc colonial or something and there's people there and they'll tell you where to go and all this stuff um but this one was like a dedicated indian theater but only during certain hours like during other hours like it was an arcade and there was like movies playing or whatever but during like the night hours was where it became an indian theater and like people at night were renting it those were like indian people who were playing those movies there was only one viewing room um it wasn't very big there wasn't even any stair steps to it like it was is a very small like very intimate thing right the only people that like if you're a frequent there if you're a regular there you'll know all the other regulars there as well which like we did that's how it worked um and i was even talking about it at camp and alim was like oh shit dude i've been to the same one and uh i'm not gonna talk about the connection that other people have with it but me like i i could draw the whole thing like i remember exactly what it was i remember the pattern on the carpet like the uh, arcade pattern um i remember going there and like um it, even though it was closed the arcade machines were still on some of them at least not all of them but like all the indian people would come through and you could buy stuff uh, and there was like a DDR machine and it was like the classic like you could put quarters in it, you know And I was terrible at DDR, but I still loved it and we always got like um, Milai kulfi and stuff like that, which is like a kind of ice cream It's not like a, there's different kinds of um, like there is ice cream in India But then there's also kulfi in India and then there's also another thing But like this is like a kind of it would be like what you would call Indian ice cream It's very common. You can go to any Indian restaurant and ask for kulfi. I recommend Malai or mango uh, I, I don't really like the mango, but everybody else loves mango. But I remember eating the Malai uh like how great they tasted over there. Man, that place, I got sour skills every time I went in, which I ate like, I ate it till my mouth was sore, dude. I ate it like it was my last meal. I have so many memories in that theater because this is, we were a movie like family. That's what we were. Like we watched movies all the time, dude. We watched movies an obsessive amount, way more than most families. And that's, I think this is where I developed my love for film. Not only for watching it, but for criticizing it, for reviewing it. This is where I got the Green Goblin and Cartoon Wars on iOS, on my iPhone 2G. It's where I would uh, randomly meet Ismailis that I would become super good friends with. You know what? This wasn't even an Indian theater. It was an Ismaili theater. That's what it was. And, and it just so happened that most of the Ismailis that live in Atlanta are Indian or Pakistani. I, I remember watching the movie, not in this theater, but I remember watching the movie... But I remember hearing the song like a million times because it's like everywhere. They play it at every wedding. They play it at every like everything that that every event that happens, they play it. You know, it's like an iconic, like legendary song. It's like a that song is like a take all of Adele's songs and combine them into one. And that's how iconic this song is for Indians. And see, Ismailis are a small community. There was only like usually like 20 to 20 to 40 people in the movie theater watching with us. Sometimes there was nobody else, actually. And uh, me and Faraz would, like, go up to the screen and, like, um, my brother, Faraz, we'd go up, we'd, like, touch it and, like, jump around and, like, play tag in the theater and we'd scream and stuff. And as we grew up, like, uh, I would say about a, about a third or so of, of, like, the people who were around us, like, stopped being religious and they stopped paying money to the organization. It was mainly because you had to pay money to the organization. So it's, like... A lot of these things are like dying traditions, right? They're super uncommon. And the fact that like, like I don't experience this kind of thing anymore. I go around and everything is American to me. I don't get to experience the kind of culture that I was born into that I could have stayed in. Um, these traditions are dead for me. I don't uh, care if I eat pork or do any of that stuff, right? I don't care about these things. I won't relate to the memes that other Ismailis have, that other Muslims have. I won't relate to them anymore. And um, the fact that like, we're in this camp primarily because our, our parents are aware of this. Our parents are aware that these traditions are dying within us and that, hey, we should make them experience it. We should make them have fun with it, you know? And the fact that like around like 40 to 45 dudes, just we all know this song so well as if we all had the same childhood, as if they all, I felt a connection, a kinship with these dudes because that was such a, 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 a formative thing for me to know that song. And me thinking to myself, damn, all these guys doing the same thing as me? They're, they're like the same person. We're a tribe. We're a family. We're kin. 
that's what it felt like. It's something that like people who aren't part of like a like a minority group will never be able to experience. Like minority groups are privileged for being able to experience things like this. Being a part of a small group of people, like um, a Dunbar's number, a healthy number of people, like knowing that you're all in a tribe, that you're all a, a team on the same page, that you have each other's backs, that like, oh, if one of you gets into a fight, it's not gonna be a fight. The rest of you guys are jumping in to help him. It'll be a massacre and it'll be in our favor. And just like, just like knowing that, like having that in the back of your head always that like, oh yeah, we're brothers, you know? How could we not be? In, in that moment, in that moment, when we were all just singing, I was thinking to myself like, wow, there isn't a drop of animosity between us. As much as we might like, you know, throw shade at each other, as much as we might hate each other before camp, after camp, as much as they might want to kick me out of chat, whatever, right now in this very moment, we are one in the same. How could we hate each other in this moment? How could you hate someone who loves the same thing as you? How could you hate someone who has the same child as you, childhood as you? Who is, who is wearing the same clothes as you? Who's wearing your boxers? Who is showered with you? Who's been in mosh pits with you? Who is singing the same songs as you? And who thinks of it naturally just like you do? You can't. I swear, dude. You want to get world peace? You want world peace? Get the world leaders together. And instead of them making them like... Oh, you need to uh, wear suits and be all serious and put on these fancy high-end meetings and go into these places and eat the nicest Wagyu steak and lobster and all this stuff. Everything's formal and there's, uh, we're going to do things on paper and there's going to be wooden desks and there's going to be photographers and you're going to be talking with perfect grammar and you're going to read off the script. Like, nah, dude, just get them to wear whatever they would wear going to sleep. Have them all go into the same room and just get them to do karaoke together. Boom, world peace achieved. That's how you do it. But that's never gonna happen. Too many people take life too seriously to make that happen. Because karaoke is not serious. That is the opposite of seriousness. But yeah, it was um, in that moment, it was just pure magic. It meant so much to me. Even though it was like a small moment um, of camp itself and afterwards everybody was like, ah, oh, so funny, right? It means so much more than that. It, it's funny for a reason. It's funny because it pierces into the into the core of our subconscious. That's what it is. That's why it's funny. It's not funny for no reason. But yeah, that was that was the best moment of Aluma. And you know what? I'm actually starting to remember a bit more now. That camp was packed, yo. I really I'm tired of streaming. I really can't say everything. I'll have to split this off into another stream. I'm not gonna do that. But like, I'll talk for a bit. Every everything every moment of that camp, we were doing something every moment like that's how you live dude damn i should make something like that i should make a camp like ah, i'd get in trouble with the law somebody would probably break their skull in a mosh pit or something you know people need to do, th do these things on their own accord otherwise like nobody's gonna do it for you you know crybabies uh karens and stuff like that who take life seriously who take everything too seriously they get the government involved they get lawyers involved and uh there's no room for these these institutions these like uh, Boy Scouts and all this stuff. There's no room for them to take risks anymore. Now it's like Boy Scouts and now that doesn't even exist. It's just Scouts. So um, I'm glad I experienced it though before that kind of thing went away. Because honestly, I don't even know how much longer Aluma's gonna last. It was fun though. It was fun. But yeah, that was the story of Aluma. Realistically, if you look at it, the government, like if they looked at Aluma like deeply, they have every right to shut it down. Like that shit was dangerous, dude. But danger is what made it fun. Okay, wait, I was fucking, I'm so stupid. I'm going way off track. No, nah, that's fine. But okay, I got kicked out of the Aluma group chat, um, like I did with all my other group chats. And I meant to show this picture. And this one was for like, a, on 9-11, I put my yearly message there, the happy 9-11 anniversary. I sent it on Snapchat to everyone, but this time I decided I'm, I'll put it in the group me as well. This is something I do on Snapchat every year. Uh, not anymore, I don't use Snapchat anymore. Damn, dude, Google Photos is so fucking smart dude holy shit i mean now google's got like borderline sentient ai's it doesn't even doesn't even matter that's not technically sentient it can pass a turing test and that's that's more than enough but i believe this is what i sent into the group chat it was a uh, this is a bit cropped i think but it's happy 9 11 anniversary everybody and i drew this and here's the plane going to the next building i drew that kind of subtly in the corner it's only a 10 second snap it only lasts a little while there's people down there right Oh, I should have drew white people and black people. That would have been, 
that would have been a bit more divisive. That would have been a bit funnier, actually. Yeah, I believe that's the picture that I sent. It's tradition for me. I, I, I do it every year. Last year, I didn't send it to Snapchat, but last year I took a picture of my friends and I drew like a, a plane cockpit around them. And I put like hostages on the side and I put like guns in their hand and stuff like that. I did not give a fuck, bro. And I sent I sent that picture into another group chat. But yeah, this this picture right here, I legit... The group chat that I sent this into, think about it for a second. It was a 100 person, 120, 130 person group chat with like all hardcore Muslims who don't realize how barbaric their traditions actually are, which I explained earlier, like the, all this stuff in Kana, they don't realize how like crazy this stuff actually is, how like cultish it actually is, who just went to this camp that made them even more hardcore into being a Muslim. Like this should tell you everything you need to know about me. I don't hold back, bro. I'll make fun of anyone, even myself. And this is, that's straight up, bro. If you get offended easily, let me just put this out there. You get offended, then, you know, go shut your eyes, cover your ears, go hop back in your crib, go sip on your little baby bottle, get off the stream. You don't belong here. And unsubscribe for me too while you're at it. Like don't, don't watch my videos, leave. I don't want you. <sighs> so yeah, that's all I gotta say this time for real. Unless I, like, think of something else. Nah, I can't think of anything. Um, and if I do, just tweet. Nah, if I do, I'll, I'll talk about it. And I'll, I'll add it to uh, uh, the playlist. I'll leave the playlist in the description for, like, Aluma and Mosaic stuff. And if I think about more stuff, I'll add it to that. But, like, damn. What a story. I feel like I'm gonna be a story time streamer. I don't know if that exists yet. I don't know if there are story time streamers. I know there are story time YouTubers. But I think I'll be, like, the first real, like, story time streamer. Because I enjoy just like telling stories. Like the, what I did just now, I enjoy this. I could do this for hours and hours and hours. My throat's starting to hurt if I talk too much. But if I can figure out some way to mitigate that, I'll do this all day, every day, bro. I enjoy this way more than I enjoy playing video games or whatever, you know? I got to get through some stories. Uh, I kind of want to get through these ones early, the obligatory ones. Be done with them. And then I'll move on to the stories that I actually, actually want to tell. So, yeah. I'm gonna go buy some Starbucks glass bottles now. Okay, bye guys. Wait, 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 I'm back. I gotta, I gotta. So this is just one thing. Okay, so I messaged this dude right here, Zoeb. I sent him the video. I was like, yo, bro, look what I found. And it was the video of the... Alma, more like all of that makeup on... So I sent him that video. Hey, this is a free De Niro shirt. And he goes, bro, you fucking sent the prison meme into the group chat. Like, bro, chill. Yeah. So yeah, I just, I just felt like showing that. That's it. Okay, bye guys.